All right, and we are up. Ah, we just lost him. Shit. (laughs) He must have accidentally hit a button. Here, uh, why don't you uh, start talking and kind of cue it up, and I'll call him, and uh, I'll be back. All right, that that works. I could talk about this. All right, uh, Peter and I talked about this concept a few weeks ago. It may have been about a month now, but uh, I'm kind of a bookworm. If some of you all haven't noticed, so I thought that I would uh, share some of the quality books that I've read throughout my time doing this kind of thing. So, and uh, we're starting off with something that's a little, little different. It's not not exclusively cannabis related, but it's plant related, and cannabis is a plant. So, this is where we're discussing this book today. And this is uh, probably one of the best gardening books that I have ever read. I've read uh, a lot. Uh, this is uh, published by Rodale. It's uh, written by a man named Jeff Cox. Uh, he'll be on here shortly, hopefully. Uh, he's ha- having technical issues, but uh, Peter will get that straightened out and we'll, we'll get to talk to the man himself because this is a, it really is an amazing gardening book. And I would have not bought this book actually if i saw this in a uh, bookstore this isn't something that i would be attracted to and and i can hear you loudly now so. I, <laughs> I think that you both just mm-hmm. dropped out on me all right i'm can you hear me yes okay. barely uh, suddenly the sound level went down sounded like you hung up the telephone oh yeah connection. no i yeah no i i hung up the phone uh, yeah, but I can I can hear you, but I'm going to have to put it to my ear. OK. All right, Elka, carry on. OK. All right, I, we'll I, carry on. Be I, brave. I, <laughs> I was given an inter, giving it a short introduction to this book and explaining that this is this isn't something that I would uh, if I saw this in the store, it's not something that I would have uh, been attracted to and picked up. But I'm glad that I have this. I, I got this book as part of a payment doing uh, landscaping work for uh, a friend of mine. She, she's a friend of mine now, but uh, started off as just somebody that my wife uh, worked uh, met through work. And she was an older lady and she needed some things done. And I, I went over there and uh, did a few chores for her. And this book was part of the payment. She got to know me a little bit. And she had when I first walked into this lady's house, she had a huge a wall full of books and it turns out that she was an ex-librarian and she uh whenever they rotate books in and out quite a bit so she got her pick of what she wanted as they were rotating books out before they started selling them and she just tossed a few dollars toward the library and she'd get the books that she liked so she had an amazing library and after i did that first job for her uh, she gave me my pay and handed me this book and she said, I think that you could get a lot from this book. And I was, okay. So I, I took it home and I, I looked through it. And it was it was actually very interesting. It's like I never would have thought to read something like this or e- even be interested in it. And I, I was pleasantly surprised with it because he covers quite a bit of subjects. Yeah, Peter's showing you the table of contents now. And it's, uh, it's very, like... Uh, general plant intensive like uh mr cox uh, your uh knowledge of different types of ornamentals and trees and just the 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 background of all of the like there's there's a large section in the back of this book that tells you uh like what types of plants work best in what situations and like uh, it, of course it has the zones and everything it's just it, this is a very informative book and I, I, I'm happy that uh, Peter was able to contact Jeff Cox and we're, we're able to discuss this book today. So uh, I'd, I'd like to start off with him, like just introducing himself to us and just talking for a little while. Like, for instance, tell us about you, Jeff, and you dedicated it, this to your dad. Like the very the very beginning, it says. For dad, very simple. You know, and anyway, yeah. so I'd like to I'd like to know a little bit about you and uh, your dad inspiring this wonderful uh, piece of literature right here. This is very informative and it's helped me a lot. I'll tell you, it, it makes me dream sometimes like I, it makes me want to uh, start a business doing this, like perfect just one of the, the things that you teach in here. 
and just do that. You could you can make a really good living just picking one concept out of this book and running with it. So with that, uh, tell us about you and like working with Rodale and and all of that. And I'll shut up for a little while and just let the man talk. <laughs> OK, um, well, that's high praise indeed. I'm not sure deserve it, but let me tell you where the ba the background comes into play for why I wrote this book. Um, I for ten years from 1970 to 1980, I was an editor on Organic Gardening magazine, and uh, during that time, and the managing editor, and during that time, I really learned a lot about plants and. Um, ornamentals and food crops. So that kind of was the underpinnings. But I also came from a family. The reason I dedicated the book to my dad, he was a commercial artist, and so was my older brother, who was 11 years older than me. They were both commercial artists and good artists. And uh, so I grew up in a family of artists and made my living in my 20s among other things, as a commercial artist myself. So I had facility in being able to draw and be creative. So as I progressed in my knowledge of plants and landscaping and putting gardens together, I wrote a book called The Perennial Garden. And I noticed that in all the landscaping books that I read and gardening, how to put a garden book, uh, a garden together, those kind of books, you know, Gertrude Jekyll and all these people had good advice. And you certainly can do that. You can go to the experts and follow their advice. But as a trained artist myself, I always knew that uh, what Scorsese, Martin Scorsese said when he said, what's most personal is most creative. And Peter Sheldahl, the art critic for the New Yorker magazine. He said, real artistry is when the decisions are made not for a purpose, which is illustration, but with a purpose that arises from within the person who's doing the artwork. No outside uh, experts are uh, contacted in order to get the inspiration to do real art. So I said, why don't we just apply those things to doing a garden and I said so okay how does a person know what part uh you know how do they reach inside themselves to find their creative juice to do a garden I mean that's our whole thing it seems hard to do but then I realized it's like when you drink wine it doesn't take a wine expert to know whether you like the wine or not. It's very simple. Either you like it or you don't like it. And it's very simple that way. So I applied that and I like to do nature walks and I like to be out in the outdoors. So I started looking around on my nature walks and noticing things that I thought were really beautiful. And I said, well, anybody can do that. Everybody knows when they like something that they see and I said why couldn't they take the inspiration for what they see in nature that they think is beautiful and think about how they would apply that at home if they did a garden or a landscape in their own property so that's what the book is about and that's how the book came about All right, that that that's awesome. It, it makes a lot of sense after reading this. I haven't read this cover to cover. It's really not that kind of a book. It's like I don't need to know about setting up a desert garden and stuff like that. But I've read a lot of it, and that 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 shows that what you just uh, said makes a lot of sense. Is because uh, I'll start off with at the beginning. You spend like the first two, maybe three chapters, just discussing what you were just explaining is observation seeing things that you that you find aesthetically pleasing and then bringing that home but and right. let's talk about that you you uh make it a point to uh, be clear that you're not talking about can you bring up the unicorn picture uh peter or not the picture of the unicorn but you you'll see the heading up at the top 
the the unicorn story. This, this man isn't talking about going out and like collecting plants from nature and bringing them back home. That's not what this is about. This is about taking ideas from nature. And that you'll see he's I'll, I'll have uh, Mr. Uh, Jeff talk about the uh, can you talk about the lesson of the unicorn? Tell them what you, what you're getting at with this. So let, let's start here. Okay, well, I'm originally from Long Island when I was a child, and my parents used to take me to the Cloisters, which is a medieval museum up on the Hudson uh, in the North Bronx. And in the Cloisters, there's a series of tapestries from the medieval days that tell the story of the unicorn. And the story of the unicorn is very simple. The unicorn is a rare and fragile fantasy beast. And uh, when people go questing to capture the beast, the only way to capture it is to destroy it. So uh, they rope the unicorn and they kill the unicorn in an attempt to capture its beauty and bring it home. So what my message is to people is this is all happening in, in your head and in your notebook. You're not to dig up plants and bring them home. It's killing the unicorn. Uh, well, all, the, all you're doing is touching the place inside you that responds to beauty. It may be a different place, and every human being may have a different take on what's beautiful. But we all know what's beautiful when we see it because we have a facility somewhere within us that rings a bell when we see something beautiful. Artists do this all the time. I mean, that's where I got the idea from growing up in a family of artists. Uh, you know, when they see something that really rings their bell, they bring it home by putting it on paper or on canvas or as sculpture or dance or any of the other arts. Uh, it's really a nice, genuine, impersonal process that puts you in touch with yourself. So this book, though it uses the idea of landscaping, really is all about taking a deep dive into your own sense of aesthetics. Yeah, that uh, as I was saying, the the first few chapters, uh, you're you're basically teaching a course. Uh, to somebody that doesn't uh, that isn't familiar with that, uh, the, like I guess what you keep bringing up the artist, uh, get, teaching somebody that isn't like naturally artistic, or, or they don't think they are. I think that we all are, but uh, somebody that doesn't feel that they're naturally artistic, it's kind of like the uh, a roadmap or a kind of a lesson plan for how to bring that out from within yourself and then like create something it does like you said it doesn't have to be landscaping or it can just be uh express the beauty that you see and use that example in your own way and in your own uh your own form like whatever your palette is use that like some people it's cooking you know they they're inspired right. by something and then they they develop a whole new recipe that they never thought that they would try before well, yes, that's exactly right. Uh, cooking is a good example of something that most people do quite a bit, and uh, they get good at it. One of the things that I heard most growing up and being an artist in high school and college where I did the illustrations for the yearbooks and stuff like that was people would always say, you know, I can't draw a straight line. And that always used to bug me. Because who cares if you know how to draw a straight line? You know, some of the great art that's been produced has nothing to do with being representational. It has to do with putting your, finding your feelings and putting them out there, turning them from internal to external. And that process is almost sacred because any artist who's good will tell you this it's not it's not me it comes through me i'm some somehow when i'm working i'm lost in time hours can pass and it seems like minutes and i feel that i'm just the hand that guides the pencil but something is coming through me and it's the creative spirit so you know in that sense it's a very spiritual thing so to apply that to gardening and landscaping 
seems to me to be a, a, a wonderful idea. I was very happy to write that book. It was really a, a treat to get those ideas out on the pages. Yeah, and you did a good job organizing them too. There's, there's a lot of great ideas in here. Let's get into some of those. Uh, that's, you you get into some, a lot of DIY projects. I didn't send pictures of the, this kind of stuff to Peter, so that's, I, he doesn't have pictures of this. But it's, it's basically like building structures and to to starting with the basis for the plants to something for them to grow out of or grow around. Like right, right now, I'm looking at how you uh, design terraces and teach people how to uh, arrange rocks and set rocks properly. I, I, I noticed these as very ancient techniques. It's the same way that a lot of the large rocks around the world, like they, they built a, a bed underneath before they dropped those big rocks into the hole. And there's a reason for that because oh, that even then they understood that these things are going to sink and sink. But anyway, is you, uh, you, you have a lot of structural things in here that are is like, just for like a guy that likes building things and wants to make like the backyard prettier for the wife stuff like that you, you teach uh like here in the back here's another one's structure he teaches how to uh let's see how to build a bridge over a water feature and, and like do it properly see how he's got footers underwater and like a uh, slate underneath of that it's a, and it's very detailed it's the, there's a lot of stuff like that in here i'm not going to go through and pick all of those pictures out and hold them up but as just, there's a lot of like interesting cons like I just the, the coolest thing about this book is that it's like the epitome of a coffee table book It's like or like at a doctor's office or something. It would be great for places like that because you can pick this thing up like I just did and flip to a page and you're going to find something cool like this. Like how to build a planter out of a fallen log. And I've got a lot of fallen logs around my property. I think my wife would like for me to do some of that. <laughs> anyway, so it's anyway, there's there's like I said, you can just flip to just about anywhere in here and just like move a page or two over if you're just finding a bunch of text and you're going to find just a beautiful picture at least. Or can you talk about that? Like, who, how did you meet this photographer that took all of these? Uh, there's like an amazing color picture section. And I, I sent a lot of those to Peter. Maybe he can flash those up while Jeff is explaining Th this photographer went all over the country, it looks like, and got some really amazing shots. And it's good ideas. Some of these pictures are showing like uh, the natural environment that the this person like replicated. And when those pictures pop up, I'll point those out. But there's a, can you talk about the photographer for a few minutes, please? Sure. Um, well, I had written um, a couple of books that one was called uh, Flowers for All Seasons. And it was about plants that would give you flowers even in the winter time, uh, it, where the climate is would allow it. And um, I used a photographer named Jerry Pavia, and Jerry lived in northern Idaho, way up near the Canadian border, and he liked to do nature photography, so he was real good at it. But he also did garden photography, you know, and pictures of nice combinations of flowering plants and trees and landscaping. And he sold them. So I had worked pretty closely with Jerry. So when it came time to uh, do this book, I used Jerry and I also used a guy named David Cavaniero, who is an excellent photographer. He finally, uh, he lived here in Sonoma County where I live in California. And, um, then he jumped ship and went to Decorah, Iowa, and worked with the Seed Savers Exchange for years. But he was, besides growing plants out to save their seeds, his real talent was photography. He was terrific. So between those two guys and some other photographers that I knew, uh, you know, we selected pictures that represented what I was trying to get across to people. I mean, to me, the, the gut of that book is in the very beginning, I talk about going out into nature myself in places I visited and where I discovered a grove of trees. It was really pretty. And this was just a natural grove growing after, on a Sugarloaf State Park here in Sonoma County, a beautiful state park. 
And so I thought about, you know, how to bring that home. And then I found a creek with a little waterfall with uh, tumbled stones in the bottom that over the centuries had been tumbled into little cabochons and rounded stones. And they looked pretty in the sunlight as it came through the leaves and glittered down there. And that was pretty. And so I went around uh, for days and days just making notes about things I saw in nature that I liked and then told uh, in the text how I interpreted them at home. Uh, for instance, when I got some, I went over to the beach here in Sonoma County because the county um, is bordered by the Pacific Ocean. And there's lots of tumbled stones over there from you know, millennia of rocks being tumbled by the waves. And I selected a whole bunch of different colored rocks that were all beautiful, beautifully rounded. And I brought them back to my house and I set them in a bed of moss. It was real pretty the way the moss grew among the stones, something I, it, very typical that I had seen out in nature. And put a little water feature in there, sunk a half wine barrel in the earth. And um, it just was as pretty as a picture. And it started drawing wildlife. So I like that aspect. Birds would come and insects of various kinds. And as you know, you want to bring life to your garden, just have a water feature because uh, all life needs water to live and everybody will come and drink. So, I mean, those were the kind of things that I wanted to give examples of how to do it, or at least how I did it, and then encourage people to apply their own aesthetic sense. Again, it's all about saying, hey, you have a wonderful creative sense in you, whether you know it or not. And, you know, even if you're a beginning gardener, don't be afraid to put your finger on what pleases you and bring it home because that's where the inspiration comes from. Absolutely. And as you go out into nature and do what he's saying and get ideas there. And then you also have to look at what's around you too. Like what's what you, what you're able to grow. He spends a lot of time on that in this book too, is like, you're not going to be able to grow some things in your area because you don't have the soil for it, or you, you don't have the climate for it. There's the, there's there's specifics involved here. So you're going to have to like settle for something that's similar. You may not be able to have that exact plant. Like he, uh, he brings up the lady slipper a lot in here. It's one of those unicorns that you can kill trying to bring that thing home to your garden. We, we talk a lot about you. Uh, what's cool is this book was written in 91. Uh, uh, if I'm correct about that, at least the copy that I have says it was published in 91. Yes. And, and, uh, What's cool about that is he, he talks about mycorrhizae fungi in here. You don't use that term, but you talk about that uh, symbiotic relationship between the fung fungi in the soil and the plants themselves. And that's something that's talked about on this channel a lot. It's something that cannabis growers are very passionate about. And uh, it, it, we call it the living soil. Uh, everybody has different names for it, but that's, that's a good way of generalizing it. If uh, I think Peter would agree with that. But well, anyway. if there was one, if there was one topic that we really hammered on Organic Gardening Magazine, it was the role of soil in plant health and what that meant. And you know, again, we transferred it to the human body. The same processes that go on in the soil go on inside of our intestines. The same, a lot of times, it's the same microbes dismantling our food into nutrient elements that are then fed to us through their intestinal walls. It's the, if you think about it, a root in the soil is like an intestine turned inside out. The intestine has the soil inside. The root has the soil outside. The root hairs are the absorptive functions. And in the intestine, the villi, that stick inwards into the soil as the food passes through the intestines, also absorb the nutrients and then pass them on to the human body. So it's the same problem. And when you understand the nature of health, you also understand the health of nature. 
and how and it was all about health. And this book, the landscaping with nature, does feature a lot of information about how to do a landscape or a garden passage that is healthy. And one thing about going out in nature and looking at the plants in nature is if you're talking about wild landscaping in your neighborhood or around where you live, you're talking about native plants because unless the invasives have come in, of which there always are some, but you you know, using native plants in your garden and getting inspiration from how nature uses native plants is really a, a good way to go. I mean, the the rule of thumb is let nature be your guide, you know, follow nature and you'll do all right. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, uh, where I am, uh, nature takes over. You, nature tells you what you're allowed to grow here. You're not. A, you're not. You don't really have much say. Uh, the, where are uh, you? My, my, I, I'm in the Ohio Valley. Very rich. We have about. Uh, I guess in some parts of, of the land that I'm on, I've got like two feet of topsoil before I get down to the red clay. So it's a, it's a really nice environment for growing. So yeah, you bet. So uh, I grew up around plants, and this is uh, uh, this is a this, this runs deep with me. As a, I'd like to tell the audience that back in 1991, there wasn't a lot of people that would be able to write this book, other than guys like Jeff and the people that he was working with at Rodale. As a uh, organic magazine, organic growing magazine, that was that was one of Rodale's uh, publications. Am I correct? Yes, I, think I have a few yes. of those uh, actually. I, I've never yeah, made it, the connection that you that you uh, were editing those magazines because I'm pretty sure I've got a few of those that, that Miss Ka gave me. Uh, she, well, you'll she find me, me on the you, you'll find me on the masthead if it's between 1970 and 1980. Uh, we had the, the time of our lives. I was so lucky to be on that magazine for those ten years. I mean, the the world exploded with interest in environmentalism and uh, back to nature. And everybody wanted to know what we had to peddle. And what we had to peddle was the genius of a guy named J.I. Rodale, who founded the place. And he was the one back in the 30s who saw the connection between uh, healthy soil and healthy crops and healthy animals that ate those crops. Absolutely. I said, I, when I was uh, talking to Peter about this concept, I sent him a, a list of books. And I would say that about half of, half of that list or close to it were Rodale publications. Because as you said, there, there was a lot of information that you all needed to get out and you you, you all definitely got it out there. There's a, there's a, a a lot of people in this cannabis space uh, think that a lot of the uh, concepts that are talked about on this channel and other ones are uh, relatively new, and they're they're not. They're they're some of them are very ancient techniques. Like he he talks about Paleolithic man in this book, and like how we still have uh, aesthetic desires that date back to that. And you, like you you talk to an anthropologist or something the on that subject, am I correct about that, or did I? I think so. Yeah, I, I yeah. remember uh, doing a lot of research in the on those lines. Yeah, it's like I, I, I've always uh, yards bother me, like just open grass, unless you've got like uh, animals on it or something like that. And uh, you have a few pages in here where you're that are devoted to yards and the the lawn. And I, I always thought that it like just it was something that carried over from royalty. But you explain that it's that we like open the human brain likes open spaces because we feel more at ease, which makes a lot of sense. Because when you're in a forest, you can't see too far out and you don't know what's you, it, it kind of puts you on edge, not knowing your surroundings, just just having the perspective, you know, and, and uh, I'd never thought about that before. It was just an interesting thing to read in a gardening book. Well, when you can see the mountain lion creeping up on you, you have a distinct advantage for continuing to live. And also when you can see your prey uh, wandering around out there, uh, you have a distinct advantage in bringing that prey down and having him for dinner. 
So yeah, we have a built-in uh, preference for at, at least having some of our um, landscape be open so we can see out there. And it doesn't all have to be open, what I found talking to anthropologists, but we definitely like to see what's coming at us and what we can gather from the, the um, you know, the, the surroundings in terms of food. All right. Can you, can you bring up some of those pictures again, Peter? Uh, like the, uh, there's one of them that shows a lot of rock. That one's just absolutely beautiful. And you, that picture on the, the page on the left, there's probably like 30 different plants just in that one little planting. And you can tell by the, the size of these plants because those purple things are hens and chicks. And people that are familiar with those are not very big. They're like a little bit bigger than the size of a quarter in most cases. Some of them get larger. But you can uh, just the diversity in that one little beautiful, colorful rainbow right there is just absolutely as uh, stuff like that amazes me is like how, how, how there's enough room for all of those roots to coexist together in that, that type of space. Well, plants like to do that. I mean, biodiversity is the uh, touchstone for a healthy ecosystem. Uh, the more, the merrier, really. Uh, the problem with the lawn is it's a monoculture. Yeah, and that one right there, Peter. To, yeah, and monocultures are subject to all kinds of problems that biodiverse systems don't have because there are checks and balances in the biodiverse system that don't exist in a monoculture. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, the picture that we're looking at here, audience, uh, the top pictures are natural formations. And the, the bottom is uh, the work of, uh, there's uh, uh, quite a few of the pictures are the work of this one artist, I guess you would call him, because it, it's very artistic, as uh, Jeff keeps pointing out. The bottom pictures are man-made. Like they create, they took the idea from that top picture and then created something like on the, the page on the right, they've actually made it more beautiful. They took that, that concept and the, uh, as he was saying, moss growing between rocks is very pretty. You see it in nature a lot. And you can do that with uh, in the sun too. A lot of times the moss is like it, it's in, in a really shady area, but you can grow little bitty uh, leaved plants in between rocks like that and create the same sort of effect. It doesn't have to be moss and you can have that same effect in the sunny spot, which that looks like that is. But anyway, there's uh, several pictures like this in there. And it's just, it gives you an idea of you just take that idea from nature and they didn't have to move any of those rocks. They just created something like it back at home. And so th yeah, that these was pictures. A, that well, that ahead, was sir. a gardener. Named, that was a gardener named Harland Hand. And he was one of the finest landscape artists I've ever encountered. He's gone now. Uh, and he was, he lived in Oakland. Those, you know, most of those pictures that you're talking about that are so stunning are, uh, were taken at his gardens in Oakland, up in the Oakland Hills. Oh, and uh, wow. the first time, yeah, the first time I went to his gardens, I was just floored. I just, I can remember, I just sat down and stared for about a solid hour at the two or three feet of what was growing right in front of me. Just so gorgeous. Yeah, there's a, a lot of those pictures in here from him and they're beautiful. And these pictures right here, I included those is because it shows how simple this can be. Look at that picture on the left. That's all, that's just uh, daylilies and daylilies tr grow like crazy just about everywhere. They're actually yeah. kind of invasive, but it's it, just how simple that one little planting is and it spreads on its own and everything. It's a it's a beautiful thing. It's just showing how simple just planting a couple seeds or a couple bulbs of something and how it'll transform that entire uh, space. Like it's a, what we're talking about here is beauty. He, he keeps talking about uh, art, artistry and all of that. And that's the that's that's what artistry is. It's just creating beauty in many different forms. And a lot of people don't think about it when it comes to, to plants. So unless they're, you know, like flower arranging and stuff like that. So this is this. Uh, I, I really enjoy the opportunity to talk to you, Jeff. It's, 
This is a, one of my favorite books. I've learned a lot from this thing. I've applied a lot of the knowledge in it too. Well, it's my pleasure talking to you. And, you know, obviously it's very gratifying to speak with somebody who has deeply understood what I was after with this book. And, you know, I really believe in what I wrote in this book. I believe that gardening is fun. It's nice. You can make it look pretty like Gertrude Jekyll told you how, but it's nothing compared to coming up with the ideas from your own uh, aesthetic sense inside yourself and working with those ideas in reality out with soil and plants. It's, it forms a connection that's very deep and very meaningful in, in ways that just following a paint by numbers approach isn't. Yeah. Uh, uh, the crowd on this channel understands that quite a bit. There's not a lot of people out there that risk their freedom over plants, Mr. Cox. <laughs> so so we're, <laughs> we're a strange, we're a strange bunch. Strange, for sure. strange bunch. <laughs> and we wouldn't have it any other way. Uh, <laughs> Uh, off on kind of a, a tangent, but it, it seems like some of what you're talking about is is kind of like if you look at the, you know, the the 17th century French gardens at Versailles or whatever, where it's kind of like man wants to show that he can dominate nature and create kind of these perfect landscapes versus I think what this book is like the opposite end of the spectrum. So can you kind of talk totally about the opposite? Those two schools, it, it, it's almost like painting where you go from like hyper realism to impressionism or something like just totally different uh, or cubism or, you know, just things that are coming at it from totally different places. Well, I've been to Versailles and my uh, impression of Versailles was total suffocation. It was like, let me out of here. God, it was so overthought. I think any artist who's a real artist will tell you that the quickest way to ruin any kind of artwork is to overdo it, to get past, to drop simplicity and go way past it. I mean, even Jackson Pollock, if you can remember his paintings, his drip paintings, they were simple. I mean, they were complex in the way they looked. But really, it was a very simple idea. He just took paint on his brush and dripped it up and down the, in, in various ways. And he had an idea behind what he was doing. It's the same thing with gardening. I think that uh, make sure simplicity is part of any garden design. And by simplicity, I mean blank spaces. Blank spaces are so important where nothing is growing. Maybe you just have it mulched. It really sets off the plants that are there and gives you a chance to appreciate them on their own. So simplicity is one of the, the major three points of putting a good garden together. Uh, color, leaf shape, and simplicity are my three watchwords. So speaking of putting it together, there's a question about kind of how intimate, like you have your yard and you know, where do you start? So you have kind of, I assume most people are probably starting with a perfectly manicured yard. Uh, so the question is, it'd be cool to discuss the design process in general, kind of intimidating to start. I started by dividing my yard into zones, planning those out. I like that idea. I think you should start simple in some little corner of the garden that's out of the way where you can experiment with these ideas and see if you can pull it off to your satisfaction. And, um, you know, once you get that little part going, then, and you notice how you walk there, then think about what you might see on either side of your, your walking path. It gets you to that little place that you designed. And by little place, I mean, you know, five feet by eight feet maybe. And uh, what can you put in there that you've seen out in nature that really turned you on? Was it rocks and that tree growing between the rocks? I think I mentioned in the book that um, here in Sonoma County, where a lot of land was uh, cattle ranch land, uh, and also where there were a lot of uh, 
subsoil rocks protruding, you know, almost invariably would see open space and then a bunch of rocks and then a tree growing in the middle of the rocks. And the reason was the cattle would eat everything, but they couldn't climb up on the rocks. So that's where the tree grew. But it makes a very special kind of look that you could easily do at home with rocks and a, a plethora, for instance, that only grows, you know, 10, 12 feet tall and gets pretty flowers on it. Um, so, I mean, th that would be a simple idea, but uh, that'd be very effective. The picture that uh, Peter's showing right here is this is a, a backyard in Long Island. And the people that are familiar with Long Island is there's not, unless you're in the, the end of it, where well, I guess Hamptons and all of that, that, where the rich people live. Most people in Long Island have a yard like this. It's very small and compact. And they were able to basically seclude themselves. Like you can hardly see the neighbor's houses from this picture. And it's yeah. just amazing that they were able to do such. It's like they look like if, if you didn't know better looking at this picture, you would think that they had a lot of land surrounding them. But you, they're like I said, they're in the middle of Long Island here and they've got like a forest in their backyard. It's beautiful. Yeah, Long Island soils are pretty much sand. I mean, Long Island is pretty much a sandbar, a 120 mile long sandbar. I grew up there. But, uh, you know, it's fine. It just means the soils drain well, which is good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, 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 to kind of uh, maybe help with the person's question earlier about like starting off small, it made me flip to one of the things that I have marked in this book. It, it, towards the beginning, he starts off with little small areas. Like I'm right now I'm looking at like a, a campsite idea. He has a couple different ideas for like setting up something like a, just a fire pit and then having plants around that. And then he gets into the, the ins and outs of having something like that. Like when you have, like when you're building a fire pit into the ground like that, you need to think about uh, drainage and it's, uh, it's little things like that that are in this book that you like when, when you first plan it out, you're just like, okay, I'm just going to, put this little hole of rocks in the ground and I'm going to have fires in that. And then I'll, after a few rains, you've got like a, a mosquito breeding area, you know? <laughs> so a, it's, a frog, it's, a frog yeah, swimming pool. Yeah. You know, it, but it, you could start off with something like that. A, a, it doesn't require a whole lot with something like just uh, setting up a campsite in, in your space. If you have one, there's, there's uh, speaking of that, there's another thing I, I, I'm not trying to, there's something in this book that I, I like a whole lot. Can you bring up the, uh, the dog picture, Peter? Like, I'm not trying to be insulting with this, but it, it, it's to, to make you think if you live yeah, in an on. apartment, this is, this is not a knock on you. I lived in an apartment at one point too, but it's just that, uh, it's a, this book is kind of a, a way of thinking of like how to how to approach the world that we're living in. And this quote right here, this is this is on page four. It's, it's right at the beginning of the book. And it just is it kind of set the whole tone. This is one of the first things that I read when I opened this thing. And it's, so, like I said, I'm not knocking people that, that live in an apartment if they have a dog or something like that. That's not, that's not what this is about. It's a it's a it's a philosophy like uh, really one of, I got so excited when Peter told me that he got in contact with Jeff Cox is because this book is written. It's like it was written by a philosopher, not a gardener. There's, there's a whole lot of interesting uh, historical concepts in here and there's a little bit of philosophy and it's just, it's, it's really cool getting to talk to this guy in particular because it, I, I understand he's written a lot, written a lot of other books too. And I imagine that they're as, as cool as this one. But it's, it, that, that concept of uh, why live in a place that's not fit for a dog, just I've always got it, gotten a kick out of that. And it's like, uh, it, why did you include that in here, it, if, I, if you don't mind me is, asking? Is, if, is that the quote? Uh, yes. Of, yeah. Why well, live in a place that isn't fit for a dog? <laughs> well, <laughs> because it was it was the end of the back to the land movement of the seventies 
in all my, uh, which I did. I mean, I went and got a property out in the middle of nowhere in the country, not far from Rodell Press, but about a half an hour's journey into the wilds of Berks County, Pennsylvania. And really, I, I lived out there and we did everything. We grew grain. We ground our own grain. We made our own bread. We stored stuff. We canned stuff. We heated by wood stove. You know, we were back to the landers because I was writing about it. And you can't really write intelligently about something that you don't know what you're talking about. So, you know, we had to do all that stuff. I just about killed myself <laughs> doing the gardens that we did. I mean, you know, I, I'm not a big guy, but I did a lot of carry and believe me. So, um, yeah, it's, it wasn't really a knock on people. I've lived in apartments, of course, and I lived in New York City for a long time. So, uh, but the question is more rhetorical. You know, if you have to choose a place to live, why not try to find a place where you have contact with nature? You know, if you live in New York City, unless you're right by Central Park, you don't have much contact with nature, uh, not the, the the wild kind. But um, that's what that quote was meant to suggest, that uh, if you can try to get out where nature is happening and you'll discover not only beauty in nature, you'll discover a lot about yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's beautiful. Thank you. I was, that, that's what I was hoping to hear from you because I knew it wasn't derogatory. It's just, and the people on the internet, people take things a certain way. And I, I didn't want to uh, feel like I, I was insulting people or for them to feel that, that that's was why I wanted that put up there. Like, as you said, it's a, it's a rhetorical type of thing. It's, it's to make you think uh, yeah. nothing more. So yeah. that's, uh, so uh, turn me on to some of your other books. What else have you written? Like what you said that you well, had a lot of fun with this one. What's another one that you had a lot of fun with that I'm going to enjoy as much as this thing? A uh, book called The Spirit of Gardening. All right. Uh, that, that was published in, I think, 80, 1986. And what it is, is um, it's a book of about 50 different plants that I grew at my Berks County property before I moved to California. I moved to California in 85 and wrote that book as soon as I landed out here. And, you know, it was like dying and waking up in a new world because California is very different than Pennsylvania. I mean, all different plants, all different climate situations. So it was really... Uh, a revelation to me when I landed in California. It was like, whoa, everything I thought I knew no longer applies. I got a whole new world to explore. But, uh, you know, the book, uh, The Spirit of Gardening, it's out of print, but you can find it easily on any book search service. Just put in The Spirit of Gardening by Jeff Cox and you'll get a copy. It's an interesting book. What I took, I, what it's about is what I learned by growing all these plants, what, it, what the plants taught me about myself, what insights exploded in my mind when I understood what was happening with the plants. I'll give you an example. Uh, I had a multiflora rose bush. You know, they're very invasive and they're everywhere back east. But, the, yeah, I had one growing in the corner of my property. And one day I was walking by and there were three little rosebuds on a truss sticking out. And I said, oh, I think I'll just bring them home, put them in a little water and see, you know, watch them unfold. It'd be pretty. And also the multiflora has a nice little scent to it. So I did that. I uh, put it on the kitchen table and forgot about it. And a couple of days later, I came down. And the rose, all three roses simultaneously had opened and were perfect. They were just in in their perfect bloom. And by dinner time, they looked a little shaggy. And the next morning, they were ready for the compost pile. And I thought about that, and I said to myself, you know, that perfect moment when they were full blown and just looking great. 
that moment couldn't have existed unless they had been in bud and it couldn't have it it couldn't exist unless the moment after when they decayed and were ready for the compost pile that was part of it too because that needed to happen so what i realized is that perfection is predicated on more than just the moment of perfection but it's predicated on things that follow a course of development over time from just starting out to looking really great to being ready for the compost bin. And I thought even deeper about that and I realized, well, that makes all the moments perfect. And then I realized, hey, if all the moments are perfect, why am I complaining? So that was just one of the plants in that book. But they're all little insights into what the plants have taught me and uh, how, in fact, I'm using that idea right now. Uh, as you may or may not know, I'm a contributing editor to Horticulture Magazine, and I write a column for each issue. And right now, my columns for 2021 and 2022, which will go from the fall to next summer, are uh, I visit that concept again about, but this time about plants that uh, I know more intimately out here in California. But we all learn from the plants. If we don't, then we're not paying attention. What What are some of the California plants that you've gotten to know over the years? As someone who's in California, oh, as Verbena well? bonariensis is one. If you know. Verbena bonariensis. It's a long, tall thing with very uh, finely divided leaves and a clutch of uh, kind of bluish uh, flowers in a, in a bunch at the tips. So it's a real background plant. And it, it's beautiful because it, it kind of arches and weaves its way through more substantial plantings such as shrubbery in the front, put it behind the shrubbery and it just looks great, winding its way among the branches and falling out and throwing some flowers around where otherwise there may not be any. So, I mean, that's one, but there you know, are tons of potosporums and you know, the native plants like madrones and all the different oaks we have out here, um, just great trees. California Bay, laurels, and you can grow, you know, Sonoma County is in zone nine. So, you know, if it gets down to 26 or 27 degrees, that's cold out here. So, you know, you throw a little blanket or a little sheet over your tender plants and they usually come through fine. So it's, it's really a paradise. Luther Burbank was from Santa Rosa and did almost all of his work uh, right here in Santa Rosa and in Sebastopol in Sonoma County. And he said, as far as he could see, Sonoma County was the most perfect place to grow plants in the world. And I believe it. Uh, he would know. He, 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 did. <laughs> he, he grew them by the tens of thousands. Absolutely. Uh, since you're talking about all of those different varieties, there's another picture I'd like for you. One more, Peter. It's uh, it's I'd like for you to talk about sourcing. There's a, a it's a little block picture, and it's talking about the uh, uh, uh some acronym. But it, you know what I'm talking about, Jeff? It's like you. So you need to know whether your plant or your like if you're ordering some bulbs, for instance knowing yes. that those bulbs weren't dug out of a wild environment and shipped all over the world to you. It's, I, it's I really, really, don't have a good really way to it's really important to check your sources. If you could, you know, if you go to a reliable uh, catalog, like for instance, if you're going to buy bulbs from Dutch suppliers, they're almost all completely reliable. They do a good job over there in the Netherlands in their bulb production. It's all done uh, in large quantity and the bulbs are really choice. They pick the large ones to send. And um, so 
but if you're going to be uh, trying to find rare bulbs from sketchy sources that can't be checked from Turkey, you probably don't want to do that because somebody's making a living digging them out of the wild. So it's simple, it's real easy to check. You can all send an email to your supplier or the catalog company and ask them where they get their bulbs from. And if it's from Turkmenistan, I would say, mm, I wouldn't go there. But if it's, you know, uh, a well-respected catalog, uh, John Sheepers, for instance, he does really good bulbs. And so do many of the uh, large catalogs like Parks and Burpees. And they, they take great pains to make sure that the natural environment isn't being ripped off. Yeah, Peter found it. The acronym that I was trying to think is the Natural Resources Defense Council. You, you oh, yeah, that sure. This. So I, I just wanted to get that out there. It's like you you get you start ordering things online it's like oh that that'll grow in my environment and it's like well that's being dug up like you said in turkey or turkmenistan or something like that so you don't want to contribute to the problem it's just like you going out and pulling up a uh, lady slipper from the forest that's uh, you're just as bad absolutely something like that i have a friend who uh, is takes a yearly trip to china and he brings back some plant material that uh, just can't be found anywhere. In fact, the greatest source of Chinese plant material outside of China is in Kew Gardens in England and Sonoma, right here, the, uh, two miles from my house, is a botanical garden with all this guy's Chinese plant material that he's brought back. And one of the plants is a very rare one called uh, Acer pentaphyllum, the five leaved maple. And I have a uh, an example of it growing in my back deck. And it's absolutely gorgeous. Looks like a Chinese painting. Um, however, the Chinese government won't allow them to take plant material. They have to take seed. So they do. They take the seed, and that's fine with the Chinese, and bring it back. And they plant it and raise it right here uh, near Glen Ellen which is the town next to mine. And um, so you can walk up there in the spring and you're, it's like walking through a Chinese natural area. You know, there are all kinds of trees and strange things, trees with spikes on the trunks. And it's wonderful, but all awesome. from seed. And that's, the, that's a rule for people who like to collect plants from the wild. Check out the plants, see when they're going to make some, you know, when they're reproducing and make seed and start the seed yourself. And then you won't have to take the plants out of the wild. There you go. That's that's a great piece of advice or advice right there. I've done that with a few trees that I've found out there in my <laughs> where I go hiking as the, you uh, see the seed pods. That's how I got my red bud trees. As the, uh -huh. There's a lot of red buds around here, but I, they're not like close enough to where they're going to end up on my property naturally. So I had to. Circus can canadensis. Hmm? Yes. Uh, I had yeah. to uh, get the seed pods and just uh, all I did was buried them in, in, in the spot where I wanted them. Just buried that little seed pod and it, I got a tree. Yeah, so sure. It can be well, that where, easy. Where, <laughs> where, where precisely are you in the Ohio Valley? Uh, I'm in Kentucky. <laughs> where? I, I'm in Kentucky. Yeah, where? Oh, in the center. Where? Oh, <laughs> near Frankfurt? Yeah. yeah. Okay. My folks were originally from uh, Fort Mitchell, uh, across from Cincinnati. Okay. And uh, my, my mom grew up in Covington on the river. Nice, and, uh, nice. So yeah, she was a river gal. But my dad, being an artist, you know, he went to the Chicago Art Institute. And then when he got out of there, he jumped ship and moved to New York City and um, became an art director for different companies, as well as doing his own artwork. And that's then, awesome. you know, he, yeah, he became a freelancer, moved to Pennsylvania. That's 
when I was 10 years old, took us out of Long Island and put me in the middle of the countryside and was a freelance artist from then on out and did illustration and design. So it gave me a chance to not only have the suburban lifestyle of a, a fairly posh North Shore Long Island boy, but then, you know, I'm in the wilds with the local farm boys, everybody with their 22s <laughs> running around the woods shooting things. That, that's awesome. My, my dad has the opposite uh, path. My dad was an artist, too. But he grew up in uh -huh. the country and went to the city to where he could pursue his dream as an artist. And his ultimate goal was out in uh, California. So yeah. he wanted to end up out there because you, you're not going to become a, a successful artist in the Ohio Valley anywhere, no matter where it is. So you got you to go someplace where it's more, more accepted, depending on your, yeah, your art form, I guess. But he was, in, he was into cars. So he like did custom uh, metal work and custom paint work and stuff like that. So he, he the only place that he was going to thrive doing that was out in California and uh, having me kind of crush that dream. And then my sister, she was born with health problems. So he was just basically stuck here after that and just did what he could with, with what he could. So it was like, uh, I grew up in between the country and the city traveling back and forth because of my, uh, my sister's health. So I, I, I had that path because of my dad's path before that, uh, him starting off in the country yeah. and then being artistically inclined. He was the youngest of uh, 12 kids growing up on a farm. So as a, he turned out to be a little different than the rest. He, <laughs> well, he was left exactly alone to why do my, his own yeah, thing. <laughs> exactly why my dad moved to New York, because that's where the work was. About 15 years of, do, of taking the Long Island Railroad into Manhattan every day, he finally said, let me out of here and move to the country. <laughs> yeah. Good for him. Well, look, I got to go. I, I have other things that are on my agenda. And time is, <laughs> time is wasted. So. Time is money. Okay. I hope you don't mind. No problem. Uh, thank you that for the awesome. time you gave us. Oh, believe me, it was my pleasure. It was interesting to revisit that book. Uh, I really put my heart and soul into it. And it's very gratifying, as I said, to run into some folks who are interested in those ideas. So thanks for asking me to come by. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Hey, bye. I'll, I'll, I'll follow up with you. Okay, bye. Well, that was awesome. Thanks for making this happen, Peter. It's like I, I, out of all the books that on that list that I sent you, I didn't expect you to like gravitate towards this one like first thing. So that's 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 really cool. That's to show what? people that are interested in what we were talking about here today. This is this is it. Find this thing. It's it's got a lot of information in it about just plants in general. It's. And like I said, it, it, it's very at the beginning of it is uh, kind of philosophical. He's kind of getting you in a headspace to drive you in the direction that you want to take yourself with these ideas. So, yeah, it's uh, you could start a business with this book if you like. If you would want to go out and work outside and get your hands dirty and do something besides farming, this is, you can make a lot of money doing that landscaping stuff. You can ask a, a lot of people with the big big trucks out there in the world moving stuff around they're, they're living very good lives and working a couple months a year right yeah no, that was awesome i i I, a, I think we could bring him back on again so he has his probiotic book which uh i think would be pretty cool to do a deep dive down because that was written all i i think you you touched on the point which is i think it'd be funny for him to hear like all the kids are talking about and it's like probiotics or knf or living soil and he's like yeah i wrote about all that like doesn't know the new words but uh you know he he i think he wrote about everything we talk about on a weekly basis so yeah that's it, it's it all goes hand in hand you know it's a plant's a plant's a plant our, our plant is it's special but it ain't that special so i i haven't seen you here Good to see you, Chase. I think Chase just popped in at the very end. But uh, 
Cool. Well, so we have uh, in our the humble beginnings of our little book club. Uh, hold on, that's my brother trying to FaceTime me. Give me one second. You want me to talk about what uh, the book that I want to do next? Or yeah. you want to set something up with a with a guest? Because I don't think we're going to be able to get guests on every one of these things. Like Applehoff probably isn't going to come on a pot show. She's yeah, like well, she's like a biology teacher or something. I think she teaches science in a school. So well, so, 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 some of them also passed away, so uh, they're definitely not coming on. But yeah, conceptually, the I, I, and what I wanted to do for this one, and if he's listening, I sent uh, someone who said he read the book, uh, and I, I wanted him to tell the story of where he read the book, um, but I wanted to have him. I, I wanted to give Jeff time to talk and for you to interview them. Um, yes. So the old weed books we have, uh, I've already talked to Mel Frank, uh, who is busy with harvest season, but hopefully after that is over, he will jump on with us. And, uh, but yeah, I thought, you know, having a bunch of people who all read the book. Um, so the book of the day today is, uh, let me cue up the very first picture. Uh, well, you can say the name. I'll cue it up. Yeah, it's a uh, landscaping with nature using nature's designs to plan your yard by Jeff Cox. Uh, yeah, I, I could have just lifted it up. That's it. that's it. And I don't know if there's a paperback version out there. I didn't. I didn't do it. I, all I did was just mark some places in this book. I didn't look into this guy or, or any of that. I just see if this thing was still in print or. I, I just put a, a little presentation together. I didn't like stalk the man. See, that was <laughs> before me. the show. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> Peter's job. I've been busy this week, man. Uh, so. uh, all right. So, so the book you want to do next? Yeah, I would like to uh, do that worm book. I'd like to do uh, "Worms Eat My Garbage" by Mary Applehoff, and yeah. uh, I want to do I want to do two on that one because the, they're kind of the same thing. They're like beginners gardening books. So Worms Eat My Garbage by Mary Applehoff. And also, uh, it's just a basic hydro book. And I know that a lot of people on here don't want to talk about hydro, but everybody's got to start somewhere. And that's where I started. I started off as a, uh, I, I started off as hi with hydro kind of out of necessity. Like the first seed that I ever popped was in uh, old uh, gravel from a uh, spent uh aquarium i i bred fish when i was a, a kid so my very first there you go see it, come on here and talk to us about it about what you what you learned from it it's a very basic book it, it's like it, she wrote it like lit, uh, basically written for kids to get the concept there's a lot of hand-drawn pictures in there it's a it's a really cute cool little book and it's full of uh full of good information so and and she's a scientist it's not just some lady talking about her her little worm bin she's actually studied this yeah that's her the beautiful lady you learned a lot from her so as I, I i would imagine that maybe she did these illustrations herself yeah so it'd be cool if she could come on here but i, I given her her position in life she's probably not going to do that but anyway i'd like now, to talk yeah, about now, that she she she's an example of one who passed away already Oh, really? That's sad. So, okay, I didn't know that. That's... But what I thought would be cool, so uh, we could bring some vermicompost experts on from the day of vermicompost, uh, which would be cool. Yeah, that, that, that sounds great. And like, like I said, I want to start off with the basic stuff first. Is like worms are the most basic way that I've found to grow plants successfully. Worm shit really does work that with some peat moss and some type of drainage material and you're good to go for a while uh, and the hydro thing i want to start off with both because not everybody can do a full living soil system right off the bat and so a lot of people are more scientific minded and i'm not saying that living soil is not scientific don't take me wrong what i'm saying is is that people like precise measurements with things they like meters and like they like to be able to look at something and say yes this is where it's supposed to be. And for some people, that's a good way to start off. Like, don't th don't be throwing people in the deep end when they're not ready. So that's, that's, that's how I'd like to start. It was just basic, like a basic gardening book, like 
good published information. Don't be getting out there on uh, forums and reading through pages and pages of people arguing over something and you still don't come to an answer. Usually when something is published, it, there's some there's a little bit of uh, knowledge behind it. Yeah, I, I just clicked on uh, S. Bob's uh, link to <laughs> Trippy. I don't know what that. <laughs> Actually, how long is this? Is this uh, oh, it's 27 minutes? Worm Mania. <laughs> All right, I will watch that later. I did the same thing in my teenage years. Like that, I bought my first car with uh, money that I, was, I sold uh, yellow cichlids to pet stores all around town. And then I eventually expanded. I was taking them out of town to other places too because I'd run out of pet stores. <laughs> was like, oh, we got enough. We haven't sold the ones from last time you were here. So as, anyway, as breeding fish can be very, very rewarding. It's like breeding anything really. It, it, it kind of makes you uh notice more about living things it, anyway as we talk about that on here a lot as I, i'm it sucks that i missed that breeder conversation the other night that was really good going back and listening to it as toad toad and kevin jodry that's like they, once you get them talking you're gonna learn a lot yes just get out of the way just step <laughs> yeah. back now what well, well so hopefully uh though i mean I, I want to do those weekly. Um, so for everyone who was on it and is also listening, that's the goal. And then these, I think, uh, what what would be a, an achievable pace? Like once a month, every other week, or just kind of whenever we bang up. Like, I don't think it needs to be like on a set schedule, but I think every couple weeks maybe. Yeah, I, th I think that the, especially this time of year, things are slowing down. I could be able to make that work. As um, yeah, as I'd be able to do it like every two weeks or something like that. And you don't want to burn people out. I love when he was like, "Where do you live?" And you're like, "Yeah, the, here's the vague area I live in." He's like, "What state?" You're like, "Ah, uh, here's the state. What town?" Uh, yeah, <laughs> which, man. <That's> which <laughs> street in that town? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, it's a. I wouldn't be on here if I was trying to hide, you know. I said, I don't, I don't want people knowing exactly where I am. But I said, really, the I've said this on some some other thing that I was on too is that I don't have anything to hide but some plants, man. It's like I wish I could tell you all my real name and stuff like that, but it's, there, you still got to hide a little bit in in today's world. So as I, I love to be a completely open book with everyone. And it's got, I, I don't like the way cannabis is treated. Like one of the coolest things about this interview is the normalizing cannabis. I wish I could have brought that up with him because cannabis is a really pretty plant and you could work that into a landscape too. If you would like, it would be nice if we lived in a world where you could have a 20 foot hemp plant in the back of your yard, just as an aesthetic just something to be the background for a bunch of flowers in front of it and just create like some type of tropical setting. I said, I wish that we lived in a world where cannabis wasn't uh, naughty because it, it doesn't need to be. <laughs> There's no such thing as a naughty plant. Like yeah. I can, you can well, order I, seeds. I, I appreciate naughty sometimes though. Yeah. Actually <laughs> fairly frequently. I, I do like naughty. <laughs> I hear you, but you can order seeds of plants that can kill you freely and cheaply, but you, we all know what it's like getting cannabis seeds, you know, and they, they're not going to kill you. <laughs> and you I can know, choke what it's, on them, maybe. I know, I know what it's like getting shut down by your payment processor, uh, while trying to get cannabis seeds out to people. So, yeah, man, that's, it, it, it's ridiculous. There's really no reason for it, but that's the world we're living in. So that's. I'll hop off my soapbox now. I wish I would have brought that up to him because it's it's really cool of him to come on this weed show. And it's a, the, one of my passions is normalizing cannabis. That's why I was so excited about uh, talking to Dr. Schwab or Schwabi. I can never say her name correctly. <laughs> Once you get something in your head. Anyway, so Dr. Schwabi, <laughs> it, move, moving things along and uh, 
normalizing this plant that should have been normal a long time ago and was at one point in time. Well, I mean, when I think back to, you know, selling in college, that for me, my rationale was always, do I believe that this is morally wrong in any way, shape or form? No, I, I don't feel bad. Like I never sold Coke. I never sold stuff that I and I'm not morally opposed to Coke. I just know that it, it could someone could get very addicted to it in a way that, uh, you know, you can't recover from and uh but with weed i was always like i smoke it all my friends smoke it like and then being <laughs> being just a guy who's logical i'm like why would i pay some random dude when i could just buy it in bulk myself and get it out to all my friends so um i think all of us are kind of like that where it's just like this is it's a beautiful plant right it's a it's a it has many human uses and purposes and um yeah no that's cool so uh it's it, and it's a testament to this plant too is how it's grabbed so many of us like like i told him it's like there's not a lot of uh plants out there that people are going to risk their freedom over and there's a lot of us out there that have so it, that says something about it. It's not just because we're getting high from it. There, there's a connection. There's a connection there. And it, maybe just the, like you said, the we all like a little naughty sometimes. It, maybe that could be part of the, like you're, you're doing something wrong, but you know deep down it's not wrong, like you were just explaining. Not, ain't got nothing to hide but some plants. Ridiculous. Yeah, and, and actually speak, so... Uh with 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 the plant that it comes from uh i i i've talked to someone who's probably watching right now but i want to get seeds of that and grow that at home um and just chew the leaves and see what it's all about uh from a you know before it's processed into cocaine um which i've never done the leaf chewing <laughs> <laughs> never done the leaf chewing yeah. to be specific <laughs> yeah uh, oh yeah speaking of inebriants we talked about tobacco in the past uh, that farmer that i know he's got something for you when, whenever i get it from him i'll get that out to you peter uh so so the kind well so on the tobacco front uh I, I'd like to explore, like I, I grew, you know, the kind of high nicotine stuff out and I give those out when people get cannabis seeds. But then I also wanted to get a variety of stuff, but also one of the ones I'm looking for is something that you could, you know, use as a blunt wrapper, um, which I think would be cool if people could grow their own, you know, fronto or long, I, I don't even know, like, it'll be interesting to see kind of what, large leaf kind of cultivars people start sending in uh that uh chris mertz is growing a coca plant ask him okay oh cool strong style did grow at the tobacco um but uh yeah so, so just, just you know for me it was kind of like uh like i know you know whenever you'd smoke a joint with frenchy he'd always put tobacco inside um you know, so, but, but I, you know, his, the tobacco he would use was probably just like his, uh, store-bought, uh, like, what is it, drum or, or so, or probably some French brand, but I was like, I, I, and that's also like, I'm not opposed to smoking tobacco. Um, I, I like the idea of growing my own and, and exploring that and, uh, so obviously there's stuff that you put inside as kind of like a spliff or, um, you know, longer leaf that you could use as a blunt wrap, uh, the shaman stuff, by the way, whoever just said they were, <laughs> they're trying it out. Do not smoke a lot of that at once. <laughs> um, that, that would be, I, I, every time I send those out, I'm like, do I need to put like a, a warning for people? Like, don't don't like try to smoke this as a cigarette because you will get fucked up um yeah, as, yeah if you got heart problems too you might want, want to leave that alone i i'm looking for everything like i would love to explore all the, like i i have and when he was talking about california 
kind of coming from New England, like it's end of October now and I'm I'm popping seeds of different things and I like there's no stopping in SoCal. And that to me is the most mind blowing and I'm so appreciative of it coming from New England where it's like in the winter everything shuts down. And here I'm just like <laughs> I have so much stuff growing right now outside. So so I, I for my personal like I want to explore different things like all different types of tobacco, all different types of corn, all different types of, you know, just everything. But then also a lot of the stuff I seed out and I just start giving it out to people. And that's kind of something I, the feedback I've gotten from that of people who are like, I'm growing, you know, A, a I've never grown vegetables before and you got me growing vegetables and th that's an amazing feeling. Um, and then just people exploring stuff that's like the, for me, the other thing is kind of getting outside the very limited American grocery store choices of produce. Like everything's homogenized in, you know, you go to a liquor store and it's like Budweiser dominates, you know, InBev, Anheuser-Busch and Miller Coors kind of dominate distribution. So choice. Um, and then same with produce. It's all about the shelf life and kind of like Americans like broccoli <laughs> and or Americans like white corn or yellow corn. Uh, and, and you can't I mean, obviously, if you try, you can find it. But I, I think it'd be cool if all of us started pushing out just stuff that's a little different and that goes from cannabis that's a little different to vegetables that are a little different to you know it's almost like a grassroots up approach to introducing people to different things they could be eating consuming smoking uh that are healthy that are fun enjoyable uh, so anyway, that, I guess that was my soapbox moment, but, uh, with that, uh, so we'll be doing this kind of regularly, hopefully, uh, as yeah, much I'm as looking can... forward to it, especially mm -hmm. that Mel Frank thing, man, as if you can make that happen, that's gonna, that's, that's, it's, it's amazing that you, you have these connections and can make this happen, Peter. Like I was really shocked when you found this guy, I, I, I knew that he, he might be receptive because of the way that he wrote this book. It, it just, I, I, I was, I was very excited. So this is, you're making dreams come true for me, man. And I hope that people learn something from it in the process. Well, I, so I think also that that gets, you know, with this channel, like, I think y you and I are kind of kindred spirits or whatever, like, it doesn't have to be weed, weed, weed. Like, I don't want it to be weed, 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 weed. Like, I want it, like, you know, music, skateboarding, uh, surfing, you know, other plants, garden. I mean, whatever it is, just kind of, it's like, if you like, you know, it's like the common thread is you're someone who enjoys or appreciates cannabis or even not. Um, but like all these directions you can go out from there of like, I like to grow plants. I like to listen to all sorts of different music. I like to, you know, what activities do I like in life? Uh, you know, like I, as we we're doing this one, it got me thinking of doing more of like the art ones with like some of the kind of artists who are in kind of the orbit of the cannabis world like like mossy giant just reached out to me uh i was about to talk about that 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 episode you did with him like drawing out one of those pictures of those shirts that you got from him that was amazing that was really cool to watch that's and, you're not going to see that on a lot of weed shows and i would <laughs> absolutely i mean stuff like that it's like how do i connect this stuff to my kids like someone was mentioned so <laughs> this shirt i think Gemma was either two or three when she drew this and it's actually not SpongeBob, it's me, but it looks like, Sp like she didn't even, she had never seen SpongeBob. <laughs> this is just her drawing. So this is me without a beard. And then on the back, I don't know if you can see that. Uh, dad with a beard. <laughs> <laughs> that's, <So>. that's good. <laughs> And that was, I, I, she was either two or three. She definitely wasn't over three, but I was like, that is awesome. And, and I've told this before, but like, I would, 
I would make these shirts and then show up to pick her up at school wearing one of the shirts from like something she had drawn, you know, two months <laughs> earlier. Uh, but my, connecting that, it's like it'd be cool to do an art thing where I even have Gemma <laughs> like there, like drawing as well and like having having Mossy Giant teach her how to do something and then cutting to her like trying to do it which would be cool like yeah that is a it's cool something concept. i would enjoy and it's kind of like i i go with my you know is it for everyone no but are there enough people like who appreciate some of the stuff i appreciate or you appreciate or chad appreciates or you know whoever london mr toad uh you know some of the people who come through here it's like what are they into like let it rip and let them uh, kind of explore or introduce people like, here's some stuff I'm really into and I think it's cool. Like, uh, let let me let you all into my world. That's that's awesome. I, I loved the when we were talking about this over the phone, your response to me having apprehensions about it is that if, if I'm into it and if you're into it, that's all you needed to know. And as I, I really dig that attitude. This is, this is your channel and you get to choose what you put on the fucking thing you know as a, a that's that's just awesome it's, it's it, if you're into it you're going to put it on here so what if it's a pot channel it doesn't have yeah, to be no, about well, weed. well well i think that get it's i i don't care about popularity like it i mean it goes you know i talk about the dj and stuff too but like i never musically i never listen to top 40 music or like popular music um I, I like exploring, I like finding stuff I've never heard before. And, and, and when I DJed, I would consume, I, you know, th this was uh, back, <laughs> it's like kind of now, like, uh, if, I'm going all over the place right now, but like watching Patriots games, like I, last year and the year before I could go on to Reddit and find a lot like a pirated live stream because they never show Patriots games in LA um, and back in the day when you'd have tons of music blogs of people they'd post the mp3 they'd write about a song or an artist and they would post the mp3 and I would download those things all day long and then I would just listen and listen and listen and listen and I'd be like that is a you know it'd be like some you know south african um you know kind of like influenced by fela kuti new artist or like three you know from three years previously and i'd be like this is amazing and then when i dj i'd play that and people would be like this is cool and like is it for everyone no but i i like I only care about the, it's not that I only care about, but like, I, I don't care if it's not popular because I know some people will appreciate it. I think that was the gist of our conversation. Like even if only 50 people appreciate the conversation we just had with Jeff, like, I don't care. <laughs> I, I enjoyed it and you enjoyed it. And those 50 people enjoyed it. Like I'm out like that, that makes me happy. Good so. deal. That's, that, I think that's part of the reason why this channel works so well is it, you've, you've got a lot of people that show up regularly for a reason. And it seems like some of us like, uh, what, what's he going to do next? Like, because now you're throwing a lot of curveballs at us lately. And it's like, you've got a few, few new, new endeavors going on and stuff like that. And it's, so you never know what, you, what Peter's, especially after your, uh, current events with the new baby and everything it's like you double down on the work almost too it's like you got all this extra responsibility and it's like you you went in hard on the channel as well it's like you weren't gonna let us suffer because you you're <laughs> overwhelmed because i had a newborn right <laughs> well now and that's why i appreciate all the people who have been helping out and are helping out and um like you and chad and chase and i see people in the chat and mr toad and um london and it, it I, i'm also just trying to push con like you know 
I think it'd be cool to have, you know, it's like ESPN started somewhere, right? And it became a 24 hour sports channel. And then they even, you know, it, they were just talking about sports and then eventually they like, uh, they acquired the rights to broadcast sports as like the network that always talks about sports. Um, and so if you watch kind of like the stories of the early date, like, you know, CNN in the early 80s or ESPN in the early 80s, like this new thing, cable came along. And I've just kind of thought it'd be cool, like to eventually have, you know, 24 hours a day of programming. Um, so I'm trying to like push these concepts just even doing like the clubhouse to YouTube broadcasts, like what I love about clubhouse is like, if we see someone in the chat who could add to the conversation right now, it's like, okay, do I have that person's email address? Like I need to email them. I need to let them know to check their inbox. Like what clubhouse allows is for anybody who stumbles into the room, like, Oh my God, it's a PhD in the topic we're talking about. Like, here's a mic, jump on stage with us. And they're like, thanks. And um, it leads, obviously some, it, it doesn't always happen this way, but sometimes it leads to just mind blowingly. And that's the other thing I've always tried to do is how do I put people together to create interesting conversations? That's my, that's the only thing I care about. I don't care if someone's well-known, popular, unknown. It's, can I put, one, two, three, four people together and just ideally I get out of the way and just let them talk. And the conversation is something that people are like, I am so happy I was a fly on the wall for that. You know, I remember years ago, I, I, uh, I was at an event and I had like Frenchie and, um, and uh, Baron from Nasha Extracts and uh, Swami. Uh, you may not, people may not know all these people, but uh, just talking about hash and hash history and travels through like, you know, Afghanistan and India and places like that in the 70s and 80s. And, and it, it was just such an awesome, co you know, I think I filmed it for like an hour and a half. And, uh, it's just stuff like that. And, um, and, and what clubhouse allows for it is, is for really good conversations to happen. And then it's like what it doesn't have. Yes. I, I, I Spotify's sorry. Someone's asking about Spotify. Um, it's been on like the medium top of my to-do list for like two years. Uh, and I will eventually, and actually with all the clubhouse things, I'm like, it's audio only to start with. So those would be easy to, to get up on Spotify. So I think like the Hoda Herb stuff, uh, he's another one who I appreciate uh, helping out, uh, would be an easy first thing to put on to Spotify. But um, I love the, and some people complain like, what is this clubhouse stuff? Why don't like, this sucks. The audio is this, that. And it's like, I'm trying, like it, it's, I, I don't mind trying and whiffing and like trying to get it right. Like I'm MacGyvering. I mean, if you saw like all the, the, like this input into that output to convert it to this, like analog to digital to this, that, and the other to like, just make something happen. Um, it's like the stuff, <laughs> the stuff is I'm sitting alone in my garage that I'm like, holy shit, like <laughs> I made that happen. And, and getting the clubhouse to YouTube stuff going in the beginning was like MacGyvering shit. Um, but, you know, clubhouse doesn't have, I love the chat. Like the chat is a whole community of people um, which adds so much like everybody talking can see the chat and we can be interacting with the chat. And I just think connecting what Clubhouse can do with what 
we can do with the YouTube live stream. It, it, it's a it's a concept I'm playing with and trying to see where I can take it. And obviously it's, you know, it's a little bumpy at times as I'm like trying to figure it out. But uh, like I see potential there to do something really cool, which I'd like to do more of. Um, that sounds funny. You're reading these comments of somebody yeah, bitching about the audio and you're like, you're in your head. It's like, you're I lucky you're too. getting a broadcast at all, man. Yeah, and it's uh, yeah. There, there's uh, it, there's negative comments. There's positive comments, and everything in between. And I again, th this is the stuff where I've gotten to a point where I'm like, I I don't. I'm still gonna try to do it. Like whatever it is, uh, you know. Some <laughs> how many times do we bring someone on and someone has an issue with that person, or it's like. I, you know, maybe you'll like the next person, uh, <laughs> you know, just watch something else or do, or do something else. Uh, wait, I sound echoey or you sound echoey greens. Yeah, that that's, yeah. So the, <laughs> yeah, I said, but, 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 Oh, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that was weird because I had, it's like it worked and then suddenly there was some weird audio issue and I couldn't figure out what was making it happen. Um, e even today, like, like before, actually what was amazing was he got, so uh, Jeff, uh, it was like trying to get my 91 year old father on here <laughs> and, and the technical, so, so I was trying, he has a computer that has no video and no audio. And uh, so I was like, oh shit. I was like, well, do you have a phone? He's like, yes, it's an Android. I was like, cool, let me text you the link to jump on. And then it was like, I've never used the text message app on my phone. Where is it? And I was like, uh, so that was, we started late today cause I was like <laughs> trying to, to troubleshoot. And then my favorite line, and I wish we were live then and he's like, I was like, do you see us? And he's like, yes, I see a, a like a handsome young man and a pretty young lady. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the lady. <laughs> that, that, uh, that, that was good. That was, that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, that, that gave me more credentials, actually. It's like, OK, you don't even you, you've never even texted on your phone before. That's how badass you are. <laughs> That's amazing. But, uh, He's got me beat there. But yeah, and, and then with people like that, you know, one of my things is always like I I'd like to connect different communities that operate in different silos and getting them talking to each other. So like, I mean, Jeff is I don't know if he's ninety, but he's definitely in my dad's age range. Uh, maybe he's a, a spry eighty, um, but he's a Rodale you know, j just where he's come from to connect him with, you know, all of us. And, you know, that's what I always try to do with like the plant scientists and the soil scientists. Like, I feel like people who are like, oh my God, normally I interact with like, you know, graduate students in academia at Cornell. And now I have like all these appreciative cannabis people like, really into what I'm talking about like that's cool um and it's just connecting you know different groups that maybe and then seeing what it, it's like having a dinner party with a bunch of people who don't know each other and are just all totally different but all that you view each of them as interesting in whatever way they are and it's like I think a cool dinner could come out of this and uh that's kind of like, you know, it's like, that's what I'm trying to do. So anyway, that's uh, a lot of rambling yeah. <laughs> of stuff and that's bouncing around in my head right now. But uh, for those of you in the audience, he brought Rodale up. If you're into organic gardening and you don't know about Rodale publishing, get on that because they they're they were the uh, I guess the trailblazers in this organic gardening thing is that they they really went in hard in that concept in the 80s and they 
they figured a lot of this out. It wasn't just a, I don't know if a lane worked for them or not, but it wasn't just a lane out there. And, you know, a lot of people, they like to pin it all on her. But it, these are really ancient concepts and they just like had to like experiment and try things and like develop something that could teach all of us to where we we could replicate what they're doing. So, yeah, Rodale Publishing, if you don't know, now you know. Yeah, I, I've always wanted to get kind of an under like everybody in cannabis talks about Elaine. Yep. And I've always wanted to ask other people who were at Rodale at the same time, like, I, I, I'm not discounting her. I'm just, I, I'm curious, like, I, I can't imagine she was the only one in the, in the seventies and eighties being like, you know, there are all these little tiny organisms that live in the soil and they're important. Uh, m maybe she was, uh, but I just feel like a lot, like, Jeff, I think, thinks the same stuff, and he wrote books back then. So it's like, why does everybody focus on one? I, I and I don't. I, I'm I'm literally asking this because I don't know. Like, why does everybody focus on one individual Elaine um, in the cannabis world? Um, I think we have a tendency to do that, just in general. Like with Greg. Greg always talks about his friends. He likes to give his friends credit too, but we're all about Greg because Greg's the guy that we're interacting with. We're, we're not interacting with his friends. A lot of those guys are gone. He said one of them's in, in a Florida pen still. That sucks to hear. But, you know, there was more than just Greg, but we know Greg, so we get hung up on Greg. We don't know Greg, but he talks on here with us, so it's... It, you know, that's we get. Uh, I think it's just human nature. We we kind of get hung up on what we know. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question, Chase. Wait, I, I I'd have so to shame. think about it because <laughs> my mind right now is is uh, is mush. Uh, l let me think about it. Um, I know the most off the rails one that happened, and uh, I, it took a long time to. Re I, I don't even. I, I think some people still. It was the uh, the the soul rebel uh, genetics, and then uh, I brought basically Masonic and his crew of people were like heckling during the whole time. I don't know if you remember that one. Um, I think I remember the controversy. I don't know if I actually yeah, and, and that then I I brought Masonic on thinking that. I was like, kind of like, just what's your issue with this guy? Because you've been nonstop trolling him in the chat. Uh, I, I think I was a little naive in terms of thinking that I was like, God, if you two could just talk to each other, maybe you'd stop like hurling shit at each other. <laughs> and, yeah. and it didn't turn out that way, but, but, uh, that that got to something you know it's like i i definitely hear it people like I, i've heard people tell me or people have specifically told me i like drama because it leads to more views and i'm like i i fucking hate like it, it annoys me when the chat blows up with like people bickering with each other like i i don't like drama but after that episode, I feel like that was kind of the label that was hung on me uh, but by people that I respect. And it was a bummer. Uh, and I don't think some of them want anything to do with me or FCP or whatever since then. So there were ramifications. Um, and, and and it's a bummer. Like like I, my 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 take on that was I fucked up. Like I I it was such a bizarre thing. I didn't know what I was getting into. Um, I didn't have ill intent, and my thinking of what ill intent would be would be like, let me bring this other guy on to create like a uh, who who were the big uh, like eighties uh, talk show daytime talk show hosts. Uh, where like people would be like breaking chairs over their in-laws <laughs> on stage. Uh, but, but, um, 
Peter, when you give the spotlight to fake people, real people think it's lame. Yeah, well, yeah, but um, that's true. But uh, yeah, Phil Donahue. Well, yeah, Geraldo. Um, no, Jenny Jones. There was a lot of fights yeah, on so, there. Well, too. So, <laughs> so, so on the one hand, it's like I've learned that no matter who you bring on, someone has an issue with them. So who do I, who gets to be the arbiter of who I should and shouldn't be like allowed to bring on? The other thing is a lot of times the people who are brought on are brought on by the people I, I who are like, I, I try to stay in the background and not be the host. Um, like in this example, you would be the one kind of picking who you bring on and I'm sure someone you bring on at some point, someone's going to have an issue with. And then I hear it and I'm like, well, I don't want to censor him. I mean, that's a slippery slope to go down where I'm starting to tell the people who are trying. It, it's like telling, you know, hey, we're going to I'm going to have a conference and I want you to moderate the first session. Can you do the second session? You do the third. And by the way, I'm going to tell you who you can and can't have on your panel because of what I think. And, and we've had people come on that, that I, I'm like, ugh. Um, but I, I bite my tongue and I don't know if that's the right answer or the right thing to do or not, but it's what I'm doing is I'm not gonna censor who you bring on or, you know, anybody who's doing a show, I, it, it'd be like an, I don't know, a news network saying to the, 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 the eight to 9 PM time slot person, like, no, you can't bring that guest on, uh, as one of your like talking heads. And, you know, I don't know if I want to go down that road and it, it's, but it, I, I definitely get the feedback every time someone comes on that people don't like. <laughs> and yeah. then that feedback, either it's like I get a text message because someone has my phone number, I get an email, I get an Instagram DM, I get a message in the chat comments. And then I'm like, fuck, we're, like, I can't even remember where... I know someone said something and I can't remember who said it and I don't remember where they said it and now they think I'm an ass because I didn't respond to them. Um, but anyway, it's, uh, I would just say I'm doing the best I can do. Oh. <laughs> oh, hold on. That's the uh, wrong one. I'm so sorry. As I agree with that wholeheartedly. I was about to say that at yeah, the end of Peter's yes, thing is you've yes. got to hear other people's point of view. That, that, that's the other thing is I, you know, so that's why when you're talking hydro, like I want hydro people on and. I hope that instead of people in the chat just like slamming them, it's just like, it's not for me. Like, like it, it's kind of, what what's the show like how stuff's built or how stuff's made and you like get to see how like Twinkies are made or how like, you know, big construction equipment is made. It's like all over the place, but it's cool. It's like, I'm never gonna be making Twinkies, but it's kind of cool to see how a Twinkie factory operates. Um, so like, I remember the time we brought on, uh, the guy who's doing, uh, uh, lettuce production at scale, like hydro lettuce production. And for me, it was kind of like, it's cool to just see if my challenge is I want to grow lettuce locally for local distribution at a scale that I can make a living in the grocery store, you know, wh whatever it is, it's like, here is the system I've set up to achieve that goal. And I'm going to show you all around and give you a tour. Like I, I find that cool. Um, I appreciate seeing how learning how things work, um, or how someone does something or how they approach a problem. Uh, even if it's not what I do or you know, and, and that's kind of the other thing is just, I don't want it to be an echo chamber of everybody who thinks the exact same way. Um, and like, like outside my garden, I mean, I don't, you, I, 
I make my own soil. I don't use any nutrients or ex I, I almost force myself to use like some silica, like I'll spray silica on just cause I have it <laughs> here or, you know, calcium, or I'm just looking over there, uh, just d different things, but, but I don't need it. Um, and that's my own garden, but it'd be cool to see how someone does hydro or how someone, you know, puts lots of different amendments in their soil because that's their way of doing things and you know what those different nutrients and minerals and inputs do um like i remember we brought on the uh at one of the conferences the um like the technical sales guy from bioag and uh who I believe has a PhD in plant science, like super smart guy. And I had had a, a conversation or two with him before. And, and someone was like commenting on him being the sales guy and like immediately discounting everything he said. And I'm like, he's a pretty fucking smart guy. And I don't really see him trying to peddle his solutions. I'm just appreciating listening to like, if I could pick that guy's brain about humic and, uh, kind of all the stuff that he thinks about on a daily basis, like I bet I'd be smarter for it, even though he is the sales guy at a company that sells something. Um, yeah. You know, and I feel like we have very few of those, like, you know, you're never really seeing like the marketing person from a big cannabis brand on here or a big nutrient company. It's like, there's not a lot of that. So like when there is every once in a while, someone who, f who's like the sales guy from a, a nutrient company, like I kind of just like to listen to him and, uh, you know, he's not like trying to sell or, you know, talk about like, <laughs> we're the number one, this or the, <laughs> you know, you'll get 30%. I like how you put your marketing voice on to do that. Yeah, we're, I don't we're the, even know if you, you noticed. Know, <laughs> your your yield, you know, your yields will be up thirty percent by using our products, uh, you know, on a weekly basis. Um, uh, uh, speaking of what you were just talking about, how just letting somebody talk, I have an idea for a show. I don't know if you know who this guy is, but do you, do you know who Two is? Are you familiar with Two, like the number Two? Yeah. <laughs> uh, is it Two on Instagram? Uh, no, uh, I think he's uh, the seed company on Instagram. But th that's somebody that I would just like to get on here, bring him on here, and just let him talk. Because it, he's, yeah, there, Mr. Toad, he knows who Two is. We need to get Two on here because he's got a lot to say. And usually it, he's been on Adam Dunn's show uh, a few times, but he doesn't ever, like, really get to talk. So I would just like to have somebody on there where he just like bring him on and let two talk, you know, because people need to hear what he has to say and what he wants to tell us about his history is up to him and all of that. But as I, I would just like to, yeah, I was, I was going to do the same thing, Toad. I said, yeah, uh, but yeah, let's get a group email going and see if two wants to come on here and talk because yeah, he's the man. So that's the other thing. I mean, I, I also, you know, I, whenever bringing someone on like I, I don't care if someone has a million instagram followers i I'd, I'd rather um you know bring someone on who who is smart and intelligent and can <laughs> I, yeah i didn't yeah, say it i yeah, didn't we say did, it. we didn't say it <laughs> um but Everybody uh knows. Yeah, j just giving a voice to people who deserve a voice and maybe I, I love introducing people to everyone who maybe people haven't heard of or know about, um, you know, not the same voices all the time that every, you know, it's like you go to, I, you know, before coronavirus, I went to lots of events and uh, kind of see a lot of the same people on the stage all the time. And it's like, there's so many other smart people, but like, these are the you know, it's like have conference, call up so and so, uh, and it's kind of like I'd like to. I've I've already heard kind of their, like, once you've heard someone like ten times, like 
Yeah, maybe every new time you hear them, you'll hear something new, but mostly you're hearing them tell the same stories again. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, well, at least they're not making shit up, you know, as if they're telling the same, like uh, Coot. A lot of people get on Coot because Coot's, he's pitching the same thing every time. You're, you're, you're not always going to learn something new. Every once in a while, you'll get like a history nugget or he'll throw some shade on somebody that you didn't know was a piece of shit. But, you know, it's, but you can you know what Coot's going to say, but I'm tuning in every time anyway, because as, I just love listening to the man talk and you might learn something. There's something he might go off on a tangent like we, we were just doing and something comes out that isn't part of his normal spiel. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. I love Coot's stories. He's got a lot of them. He's been around a while. And there's a reason he's got such a good reputation, too. You see that? Yeah, the, the people say a lot of good stuff about his gear over there in Europe. He's a Canadian breeder that works over in Spain now, I think. So, yeah, if you can, I, I don't know much about his, his stuff, but it, it's well received over there. It's like one of the things that's not cookies that's successful over there from what I've heard recently. I try to keep up with the seed game because uh, I'm on a, uh, I'm not allowed to buy seeds for a while now. I, 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 I blew my whole load on that last year. I bought a bunch of stuff and she cut me off. That, that Right when uh, Greg put his, puts his stuff out there, uh, I'm on a seed hiatus, but I've got plenty. I got my own stuff and it's, but you know, the, I, I still try to keep up with things. I, it, you notice, it, have you ever like looked at like a, a, a seed bank review website? Have you ever done that, Peter? When you like got into the game, were you like researching it and see it? it? That alone is hilarious. Just the seed bank review sites, because they're all pushing you in one direction. You can tell that they're like none of the places where we get seeds, you know, are on these sites or on, on these review sites. And there's a reason for that. As they're all getting every all of these people that don't know where to go are being pushed in these certain directions and they're not hearing about guys like you or jb or neptune or any of the other people out there that are that are putting out the the guys that actually know what they're doing's gear you know so it, it's kind of funny that you, you go to these uh who's what's the best uh marijuana seed bank out there and they're gonna all send you to these groups and they're all specific groups. One, uh, one group of site is gonna send, sites is going to send you to a group of seed banks. And then another group of sites that are getting paid by another group of seed banks. And they're sending you in that direction. So it's like it, this has always been shady. And the more that it becomes like quote unquote legal, it gets worse and more shady in like weirder ways. It, it's kind of fun to watch. So I, like I said, I'm not a seed customer, but I like watching the, the business. It's it's hilarious. The, I, I do remember one time there was like an article in the, um, I don't know, the San Francisco, some, you know, like the, there's the LA Times and then whatever's up in the Bay Area. And uh, on their website, they had like where to buy cannabis seeds. And it seemed like an advertorial and but they didn't make it clear and i reached out to a journalist who worked there just to be like do you know if like is this an advertorial because you guys aren't really making it clear um but i i think it lit like what's the who's the one who shows up at all the events and has huge boosts it's like seed king or or something or yeah crop it has, king is it Crop King? I, I feel like I, Crop King is what popped in my head, but I was like, "Yeah, JB calls him Crap King." Yeah, because he's selling knockoffs, a bunch of knockoffs everywhere. So, yeah, was, it, does he actually like wear a crown? Is that why you were doing this? <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I think actually I, wear a crown. <laughs> no, no, that that's the logo. Um, oh yeah, yeah, okay. No, it's not Crop King. What is it? Uh, Everybody in the chat probably knows. Is it Crop King? Yeah, right, Toad's not a on. fan either. <laughs> Hold on. Crop King. Yeah, crop sorry, Crop King C oh wow. Yeah. But it's funny because I remember like at an event it was like they had like the booth babes selling seeds, like the <laughs> you know, in like the Hooters you know, style shirts. <laughs> um 
Yeah, that's who I want to get my seeds from. Somebody that doesn't look like they've ever grown a plant in their life. Right. <laughs> that, that, that's where I was going with that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, I got to, as you probably do too, uh, I got to get out of here. Um, we have in 40... Chad will know if he's in the chat. Either at 1 o'clock, which is 45 minutes from now, Pacific time, uh, or 2 o'clock, but I think it's 1 o'clock. We got Marco, Brian, and Chad uh, on channel 1. And then Chad is back. Oh, wait. I got a text from him 20 minutes ago. Um, Chad is back talking about... And this is, act let me, I just want to get the link into the uh, chat so people can read it. So that is what they will be discussing. Uh, da, 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 da. Cannabis labeling is associated with genetic variation in terpene synthase genes. Uh, I think it's the indica versus sativa. Uh, is that that link that you sent me to? That lady okay. writing the paper? Mm, if it wasn't today, no. No, okay. Uh, Cheddar Bob only wants to be a part of it if people start arguing. <laughs> uh, Get your poo bucket ready, and man. And then, I don't know, London, if you're watching, uh, do you have something today? I can't remember of... Yeah, I and, and that's another... <laughs> It's like I, I now need to create like a group calendar with everybody booking the shows to be like, uh, let me just quickly see. So today is, uh, oh, that's November. I know we have a, sorry, London and I have a, a conference call. That is the London thing going on today. So. Yeah, growing with Marco at one, and then seven o'clock, Chad will be on with a motley crew of Spartan grown, no wait, is that today? Yes, Cascadian grown, Spartan grown, and Xenthanol slash Sync Angel, depending on which platform you're looking for them on. Um, talking about that research paper. So, and uh, there is a woman who I believe is watching right now who I am super excited to do something similar to that and the uh, Monday book club. Like, that's the stuff I've always wanted to do is just have and forever. Like, um, you know, you read some amazing paper on plant soil science. Let's either get the person who did the research, like the actual person who wrote the paper or someone who's like a PhD in plant and soil science uh, to break it down for us and be like, here is the easily understandable Cliff Notes version of uh, the super scientific paper. So. Yeah. And, and what's cool is the people that write those kind of things, they normally don't talk that way. It's they, they can explain their work easily. Yes, absolutely, <laughs> Mr. Toad. That's why I highlighted that one earlier is that the women in weed have been uh, very overlooked, and there's there's a lot of reasons for that. It's like a, a lot of our wives, they're they're not in the spotlight for a reason, and it, a lot of it has to do with children. And then there's just the, they they'd rather just smoke it instead of talk about it. I've found, you know, <laughs> to be honest, it's cool that Greens hangs out of, out with this and gets nerdy, and some of the other ladies, and it's the, that's really cool. But as, uh, the women in weed have been kind of just uh, in the shadows. It's like but beside all of these badass men that we know, there's an even more badass woman next to them or behind them, either helping push them along or supporting them in some way, sacrificing. It's like uh, my wife has smoked a lot of male plants, you know, and that's a sacrifice in itself. It is, smoking male plants isn't always pleasant, you know, so... Yeah, and uh, no, that would be awesome. Yeah, and, and it's definitely something I've wanted to do and tried to do, and I'm definitely aware that it's like another conversation with eight dudes. Um, 
And like one of the ones uh, I've been trying to set up in the background is a bunch of uh, women hash makers, um, probably for kind of the Monday night, uh, no, sorry, Tuesday night hash stuff that uh, we took a break from this last night. Oh, wow. Yeah, last night. I, I forgot it was Tuesday last night. Uh, but uh, like a bunch of the hash makers are right now uh, working a ton because everyone's pulling down their harvest. So it's like time for them to start paddles and It's like, it's like Kr Kramer and Newman uh, <laughs> making the sausage, right? So these guys... Uh, but yeah, so a bunch of uh, and and Green's Goddess. I'm looking at you. If you want to pull a crew together of of ladies, um, it would be awesome. Uh, yeah, I, I I did. I sat down with with uh, with her. I have a video up uh, when we were in LA. But uh, yeah, she would be great. Um, I agree, Matthew. And if you would like to lead the charge on that. Uh, And, and that this is kind of getting at something else. Like, just because people see stuff heading in one direction doesn't mean I'm not totally open to and, and wanting. And I I don't like. I usually. I mean, this is probably the most I've talked in I don't know how long. But it's like the shit that's on my mind. Yes, I want more women. Yes, I want more people of color. Uh, Matthew, disabled people, vets. Um, you know, conversations that aren't all just about weed, conversations that aren't all about just living sweat. Like, again, it's, it's, I feel like I'm smarter when I hear about or learn about stuff from someone who knows a lot about something I don't really know much about. Um, you know, like I've, I've heard a million times that microbes are important and it's important to have them in your soil. Uh, so now for me, it's just kind of the nuances around that, but, uh, um, you know, terpenes over THC. Uh, I think everyone agrees. It's like stuff you hear a lot and it's like, what's kind of, a some new, different, interesting stuff to, to dive into. Um, I'm totally down for it. And, and a lot of it's for me, it, it's always been a function of my time. Um, just cause historically I've always had to been be sitting at this chair <laughs> anytime we go live and that, that's why i love that other people are starting to take over um and one day elka may even be on here without me by his side because he'll I, i'm determined he'll to, to do work it. the controls and <laughs> yeah, and, just... and that that that's amazing because it just means more people can be like i want to do something and i have the people who i want to do it with and and I think the cool thing about this is also like we didn't really I mean, I think I posted about this maybe last night on Instagram, but like we can just flip the switch and go live. And, you know, it's it's not like, um, you know, when you get an email every week from a from a webinar organizer, like we're having a webinar three weeks from now, like it's now two weeks to webinar, like get yourselves ready a week away. Like here comes our <laughs> webinar, like another email in your inbox. And I'm always just like, you can go live right now. All right, <laughs> let's, let's do it. And, and I, I love that. I, I think that allows it. I mean, obviously this one we scheduled with Jeff, we were like, Jeff, when can you do it? <laughs> Uh, and yeah. he picked today at this time. And so we locked it in for, I think we booked this almost a week ago, which is very rare for me. Um, but it is probably a good thing to do to schedule things. And uh, other people such as Chad in London are much better at doing that than me, where I'm just like, <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> my my. <laughs> One kid's at school, the other kid's napping. Uh, I can do it right now, and that's when I'm going to do it. So, yeah, I, was, I, I want to learn how to do it on my own. So you just just teach me what I need to do because uh, my fall garden is beautiful out there right now. But in order for me to show that to you, I've got to like move my router over by the door and all this other stuff. So it takes a little preparation. So if I learned how to do this on my own. I could just start a little quick video, take people out there and show these. Uh, I, it's amazing what this crop, what this garden looks like right now in the fall. We, I had a frost last night. Everything is, is cool. 
was, I, I'm plucking salad tonight. I'm eating a huge chicken salad for dinner tonight because I, I don't want the next frost to kill all of my hard work out there. But this thing, it's 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 beautiful. I'd like to be able to show it off just a little quick video. But it's a, anyway, it, I'll just yeah, spend nah, a little, I, like a few minutes with me and teach me how to run this thing because I'm I've, while doing the past few shows, I can see. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I won't abuse the authority, but it's, you know, little things like what you just spur of the moment, something like that. And I don't have to do like a two hour show every time either. This will be yeah. you at the controls. <laughs> there you go. You'll all be in good hands. <laughs> all right. So all right. I'll let you get to whatever you're doing, man. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Here we have everybody. Have a good day. I love more content with that and the time flow and any troubleshooting advice. Yeah. Tune in on the next show that I'm doing on these book things. I'm going to have right. a lot to say about worms. You think that Marco would be one of those people that got, I know he's a big worm dude too. Like when Probably. we do that worm show, you think that he might want to come on? Cause he's, he knows more. He's more in depth. I'm kind of, I'm a simple person. I don't, I don't need to know everything behind something. I just need to, it needs to show me that it works so I don't need to know every aspect and all the terminology and all of that stuff. But as other people are better at that sort of thing than I am, and he's, he's one of those. It, it's fun listening to him. I'll, I'll probably, I'm going to try. Uh, I've got, it's been a pretty busy week for me, but I would like, I'd like to try to catch their show later on. Yeah, I, I think people like like a Marco who's kind of out there doing it. And then I, like where my head was at was like Allison Jack, who was the woman I had. Uh, she She's a Ph.D. from Cornell who like did a ton of vermicompost researcher. And she, she was the moderator for that day of vermicomposting. Um, OK, I remember so, her. So getting like Allison and um, the woman from NC State, uh, who is, uh, uh, what's her name? Yeah, I, I, I have a whole bunch of, uh, yeah, Yasmin Cardoza. And then, um, yeah, the other woman at NC State, whose name I'm totally blanking on. But uh, yeah, and no, I, I, I think getting a, a bunch of people who know their shit <laughs> as like your uh like uh your lifeline like okay i i need help on this like phd and you know from <laughs> nc state who studied worms for 30 years like <laughs> what's the answer yeah let the redneck shut up and let, let the phd teach somebody something as i can only tell you what i've seen uh, what, what works that's like what somebody said earlier the proof is in the pudding. Yes. Chase, that is something I've, that, that was also like two years on the list of um, uh, things that I know would be good. So I think one would be sharing like I have a Google calendar for FCP one. <laughs> I have a Google calendar for FCP two. Um, so I was thinking of putting it all together and putting it out there and so people can see. Do but, you have uh, certain parameters for what goes on which channel? Is there like a method to that madness? Not so much. Not really. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think part of it is, is I really wanted to build up channel two. Um, and so I, I, I've been going hard, you know, putting stuff on channel two and, uh, it's also it's i hope people don't feel like it's like they get relegated to like the minor league channel because that's not how i view it at all um i know channel one generally gets more viewers but the hell um, just be happy to be on man what you, who's bitching about which channel they're on <laughs> uh the no, link to actually should... uh he's no nice good. where where are you seeing that link just so i can fix it well, that's really cool that people help you out with stuff like that. And it's like, you wouldn't know that without somebody telling you that's awesome. Yeah. It's so like, you're that, not going that, around that, checking that, the fucking that, links. So <laughs> yes, the yesterday stuff overlapped and I, I loved it and I didn't say it to anyone and people started noticing. I just wanted to see what the reaction was. Uh, 
where it's that's another thing for me just sitting in my garage with like all my gear it's like what could i do that's cool like have two things going simultaneously and people <laughs> realize that two things are going on and then both those two things are actually things that they're interested in and it's like you know i i always use sports stuff because i watch a lot of sports some people don't like sports but um you know it, it'd be like on sunday like you have two good football games on it's like pick one and like dvr the other and, and that's the other thing like with live youtube shows i don't mind if people watch other stuff if someone else is doing something live like you can always come back and watch it late. like that's the thing that that always confuses me is <laughs> so just watch it later like uh yeah, I saw somebody complaining once. It's like, why are you uh, broadcasting when this other show's on? What? what you, yeah, and, and, I, and I'm I have, supposed I, to know I, everybody I, else's schedule now. I, I Come have, on now. I have, I have <laughs> no idea when. I mean, I'm starting to sort of learn when people are doing stuff, but like, I, I don't pay attention to anything else. And, and what I just said is kind of my mindset. Like, then watch theirs. Um, and then the other thing is like it's a world of 9 billion people and all these shows have like a couple hundred people watching. Like I don't, there's a lot of room for growth for everyone. Um, so I'd rather bring in new people than, you know, I, I hope that's what happens is like, you know, like I see 106 people are watching right now. Like that's 106 out of 108, uh, out of, nine billion people so if someone else is streaming at the same time and they have 110 people watching that's still a total of 200 people out of, out of nine billion so um, yeah these aren't tv networks you know you see the, the, there's not advertising there's not a, this isn't like normal like what you grew up with watching uh, that's one of the cool things about this youtube is that you're in you're in control of what you're doing it's that you don't have some like corporate entity like YouTube isn't hanging over you like they've got rules. There's parameters, but YouTube isn't hanging over you and like telling you, OK, this other show was on. So you can't broadcast now or this topic was already covered today. So maybe talk about something else is that, that that's not how this isn't TV. It's Peter TV. It's kind of like what <laughs> you've described it as a, a pirate radio before. And that's a really a good way of uh, that's how that's how it struck me when I first started watching these. Like I, I didn't always like I I tuned in for Adam Dunn show on Fridays and that was about all I did on YouTube. Really, I had to watch other stuff. But as far as getting on and chatting and it's like, uh, and, you know, and then you find other stuff like this channel and you get involved with it. But again, it's the I think people's expectations are a little off. You know, and it's, uh, Peter can't accommodate everything that you want out of this channel. He can do what he wants to do with it because it's his channel. Why don't right. you make your own if you want it done another way? I, I just I don't understand some of the criticism that I see people getting. It's, think a little bit before you say something, man. <laughs> I, well, I also always viewed it kind of like, I mean, people don't read newspapers anymore, but like if you open a newspaper you hit the headline like it tells you what you're about to watch or like what you're watching so it's like if it's not an article you don't if it's an article you don't like you your eyes just go to like all the other headlines and so you see one you do want to dig into or like with a magazine or whatever and so that's kind of why i'm always surprised if someone's like this sucks like blah, blah. it's like it told you what you were going to be watching. Like it had a title. Uh, that's exactly what we're talking about. And uh, so just go watch something else and like come back later when it's something that you give a shit about. Uh, so. Yeah, don't go to McDonald's looking for Burger King. That Those are wise words. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so All sorry, right. I'm still I'm still trying to find someone uh, was saying that the link was broken. Uh, he's nice, right? He's nice. Where yeah. uh, did he answer where the link's broken? 
Sorry, everybody's bearing with me while I... I think he said it was from one of the channels to the other. Like, I, I uh, imagine he's talking about the little blocks up at the top. All right, well, I will... If anybody else has noticed the same... Th and this is the other thing. Like, I rely on all the people here. It's like a hive mind of, you know, e even, like, good ideas for shows. I'm like, please bring that up again, because uh, <laughs> it, it's like all the show ideas i have whiteboards in here uh that i used to just start anytime the link to fcp one okay that is super helpful i appreciate that uh i will fix it in about five minutes uh yeah well a stone hive mind uh is where the what uh, I'll quit no, fucking no with worries. that. <laughs> Thank you, greens guys. And that's the other. So this is another thing is I, I channel two. So channel one <laughs> is tied to like my personal account, which basically mean like channel two is a, I don't know what the account type is, but other people can contribute to it. And I always thought it'd be cool to have something where, and, and this is what I had always hoped is like, like all the farmers that i care about like in norcal like all the small farmers i'm always like look you guys have no marketing budgets you guys are getting you know you have like all this corporate cannabis around you yes it is back um the one thing you guys could all do is pull your phone like like how uh craig from alpenglow uh does like his morning instagram uh walkthroughs of his garden i'm always like dude send me those videos because i would love to put them up and they'll get out there in front of a ton of people uh and it doesn't cost you anything and it make like it helps me add good content it helps all the people watching who want to learn and see what other people are doing and it doesn't cost you anything and i love that uh people are starting to like greens goddess and uh and others are and hopefully elka soon uh j just like do a tour of what you're currently um you know what's going on in your garden today? Like, what are you focused on and thinking about? Like, you know, I did a seed run and I'm about to harvest the seeds. Like, let me point of view narrate what's going on. Um, and either someone can send me the videos to polish up or if you have like basic, like I think Green's, I don't want to insult her, but I think she, you know, she has basic editing skills and she's learning how to edit better and uh but like she's doing it like taking you know i took two video clips and i stitched them together into one clip um and then i view my role as getting that out there and sharing it with people um i i love seeing what other people are doing i think everyone else does too it's like it's just cool to see and, and that gets back to like who we bring on. I don't care if someone has a two by four tent in their basement or if they're a big commercial facility, it's all interesting. Um, I Chase, I, I have a magic butter right up there. I actually love the, uh, fuck, the, the alcohol, um, I'm totally blanking on it. My, my alcohol extractor that, uh, Please have Odyssey. Uh, similar, uh, I don't know. I don't understand that. I don't understand it either. I, I, I do know that there's age restrictions. Um, I don't know how that affects people who are of age, but I do back up every video locally. Uh, yeah, well, Xenthanol, your dreams are going to come true because he's on tonight. Uh, and, and he's actually, a treasure, this, man. So, so, so that, that is, again, th this gets back to kind of like a communal thing. Like some of the, I haven't done it in a while, but like I would find bugs in my garden and I'd, um, I'd like either bring them inside 
and put them under, oh uh, yeah, I'd put them under my microscope and then I'd just go live and be like, hive mind, what is this? Uh, <laughs> but having someone like Matthew there with you to be like, all right, like we have five people who have some bugs and we're gonna go like, all right, Elka, you're up first. Like what bug <laughs> do you, are you bringing to the bug party? Like, let's take a look <laughs> at it. Um, and you know elka doesn't have a microscope but he has a you know he can take a photo with his phone and it's like peter has a microscope and he can take a like you know like a, a lot of times i'll do my uh um this is just shit that interests me but like the the leachate from my uh composter i look at it under the microscope over time because it starts it starts to get a little more anaerobic, which I personally don't mind. And then it gets back to aerobic after a while. Like it, it and then it gets like the, the, the liquid is like a black and it smells like about halfway through the process, it, it kind of doesn't smell great. And then it starts to smell better and better and better and better. And so I look at, you know, under the microscope, kind of like who's in there, uh, which is fun. So I think all that that gets to like a like a microscope show. Like I always wanted to do a um, like you know all right like <laughs> everyone has their microscope attached to their uh, like as their video input and uh, and let's look at some stuff under the microscopes. That's really cool. Were you, so were you like making an association to where it's like it smells this way? So you had something in your brain from looking in the microscope to where you can associate, okay, I don't have to sit, sit, I don't necessarily have to stick this under the microscope because I recognize this smell. And usually when it smells like this, I have this population growing at that time. It, it wasn't like getting that deep or is like you just like yeah, having like, fun like, with like, it tracking? Like, well, kind of both. I mean, I, I have uh, at the end, there are tons of nematodes in there. Um, <laughs> and uh you know, some stuff like, like if it's more anaerobic, like, uh, yeah. And I'm not an expert in any way. And this is why it's just like the shit that I find in like, just for me. Right. Like, um, but like stock ciliates or, you know, just different things that are associated with more anaerobic environments. Um, you know, I kind of, it's like, for me, it's the, no again, I, my, I'm, I'm not a commercial grower, so there's no, ramifications for me being wrong um but like all the plants i have outside right now that are built with my compost they're booming and loving life and like it's like personal satisfaction like i i i made all that soil myself um out of the stuff we eat and i have like my composters you know i've i've black soldier fly, I have thermophilic, I have uh, worms, and it's just fun. Like, I love doing it. Um, That's cool. Your and, daughters are lucky to have you, man. It's cool that they're growing up around all this stuff. Not all kids get to experience what these are. The, your kids are getting to see things that other kids aren't. So that's that's really cool. Well, and I think all, all, all of them. I mean, I think everybody on here watching is is, you know, the people with kids are – introducing them to to it's funny because they're you know with memories of being a kid like there's some stuff you probably didn't appreciate then but like you look back longingly now as like just yeah. things you loved from your childhood um like uh you know i i used to i used to <laughs> every saturday i was on the tractor Actually, I loved it back then. So like, you know, that was back in the days of Walkman. Um, <laughs> like we lived in the middle of nowhere. It was like 15 acres. And uh, so, you know, I'd go around with a tractor for like an entire day. Uh, and I'd have my Walkman on. I remember like, uh, like when Tribe Called Quest first came out, uh, listening to them, like, you know, riding the, the, we had a Kubota, uh, and it was awesome. It was like, you know, I'm whatever, 15, 16 and outside and, uh, 
just like memory or, or like you know we used to burn a lot in the um you know we used to like clear out the underbrush and burn it and like you got to be a big pyro with your dad <laughs> right yeah we, yep, we had a big yep. pond so like we we'd always like you know springtime that was burn season um and uh like those are awesome memories with my dad being young and and like the chainsaw and you know that stuff i want to do with i mean i have three daughters but uh you know so maybe they won't be as into the chainsaw but uh <laughs> I, I got a question for you real real quick is why does the northeast understand that and why does cali not do that is there I, like some re big reason that i'm not understanding is why they don't clear brush Y'all have a lot less fires out there if you cleared the brush out like your dad was doing in the Northeast. You know, is, is there something I'm missing? Well, so that that was at the local like household level. So I I I feel like California is like there's a lot of national forest, and I don't think they have a policy. This would be like we need Alex on here to talk about. Yeah, he'd be. Um, He'd probably be able to answer that in a sentence. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I think it's a bunch of dynamics. I mean, one is just dr like the Northeast does not get dry like California gets dry. Um, so if it's always dry and then it, global, I mean, it's getting hotter and hotter. I, don't, I, I I've only been in California since 2012, but I feel like the fires are becoming more prevalent and that's probably because it's Mr. Toad says, tell the federal government to spend the money on, on. Well, yeah. So I think he's talking about who, who's responsible for and, and going to implement the clearing of the underbrush. Um, yeah. And just the acreage involved. And I understand that there's like logistic reasons why, but a, there's a lot of out of work people right now. And there's a hell of a lot of fires going on out there, destroying people's lives. So, I'm, I'm kind of a solution uh, based type of person. I see a problem. I want to yes. try to solve it. So, so the, the, what that gets to, uh, sorry. Yes. Hempcrete. Um, yeah. So, so biomaterials is something I'd love to do a ton of stuff on. Uh, again, this gets to like shit. I personally find really cool and interesting and other people, you know, even if it's not a lot of other people, um, yeah, so our national forests in Cali, yeah, so if it's a national forest, it's federally controlled. Um, and the federal government, I, Mr. Toad and others can answer better, but I don't know if they had a better policy years ago and more recently it's changed or if it's always been the same policy, but e even stuff like, uh, you know, I, I know there were, there was a flare up, uh, I don't know if it was, um, uh, what's the flow canna like, uh, in Kim Kemp or one, of, one of those places, someone wrote something about how they had offered to bring their goats in to clear all the underbrush and flow canna, like didn't want to pay them. And, um, and then there was a fire and, uh, it was kind of like, and I told you so type thing, but, uh, the the fires out here are fucking crazy like it, it's you know i came from new england like we had blizzards <laughs> it, it's like every area has their uh just like you know it's like tornadoes in the midwest in oklahoma and uh it's like shit when you're not there it's l like here you know earthquakes fires we, we had mudslides uh with the um the malibu fires uh and it, and it's shit that i had never seen the the fire i mean now i'm used to the fires like you smell this season down in socal has actually not been as bad but uh like having ash rain down over your entire neighborhood is surreal um and the fires you know, they get close and, uh, it's, it's, it's just, and, and you can drive on the 405 where the mountains on both sides are just engulfed in flames. And like, everyone's like 
driving like to work and shit. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like apocalypse to your left and right, and uh, and but people get used to it, I guess. Um, yeah, if we've learned one thing over the past year or two is how malleable our society is. Is I, If you would have told me two years ago is how well we would have complied with all this crap that's going on. Like, we, we are very compliant people. I'm very, I'm shocked by it, is how well we have taken this, this raping we've been given. I'm not, I'm not trying to get into a political conversation. I'm just saying that it, it, it just making an observation that we have. It, it's it, it's just fascinating to me that we have accepted all of these new rules and just like gone along with it and have been very cooperative and trying to help each other as best we can. It's it. I, I would if like I said, if you would have told me two years ago that the human race would have like teamed together, sort of like we have with this, and now we're splitting back apart, of course, because that's just human nature. <laughs> I was gonna say I, <laughs> yeah, I didn't see much that. teaming. I didn't see much. I didn't witness much teaming together during coronavirus. Uh, at, at the beginning, when it we was got, a mystery, we got on one side. Yeah, and then, <laughs> and, then we get some, and, and this actually, this to me has been one of the most interesting things. Just seeing kind of the division of people's opinions on certain, you know, that's one of a million topics, but obviously it's the biggest one right now. But uh, it's been surreal, just kind of sitting in my garage doing shows and watching people on totally different sides of the same you know, argument and, uh, it's fascinating to, to me how some of this stuff starts. Other. Like yeah, the my, other day my... I tuned in and there was like a God conversation happening in your chat room. I, I, I didn't even comment. I got tuned in. I was watching the show. I saw that starting and I was like, where did this come from? This all of a sudden there's a there's a religious argument and people are throwing down and praise Allah and all this other crap going on. I was like, whoa, it, it's just yeah. it, it's funny I, how that just like appears and just blows up all of a sudden. And it's, it, it was funny watching Cheddar because he was just sitting back poking yes. a little bit. I I agree. Yeah. yeah. So, so part of what I was. Uh, yeah. Just my kind of general thoughts over the past year and a half on <laughs> on humanity as i've had a lot of time <laughs> in my garage to watch and think um is uh you know it, it, it's like i i just watched um uh what is it, the liberators on netflix or something that's a world war ii uh it's like a five-part series which was really good but it's like humanity coming together or you know Americans and for a common cause that I think everybody generally viewed as like the right thing to do. And it would be cool to see something, maybe not that we need like Hitler to come back again to rally everybody to come together, but like some, it'd be cool to see something that brought everybody together because coronavirus did not bring everyone together. Trump did not bring everyone together. <laughs> Biden does not bring everyone. Like it's uh, let's go, Brandon. It, it would be cool to see something. And I don't know if it's like what it takes to just see everyone. Like think about World War Two, like everything and everybody came together like whether you were a soldier on the front lines or back home building the war machines or whatever um like everybody was doing their part and being like we need to get this shit done and let's do it yeah, um, there's a reason they were called the greatest generation and what peter was just describing there is the reason why they, they, they got that name for a reason there's a, a more recent example of that 9 11 that brought a lot of people together and it wasn't like it was like we were all a common causes. Let's go get these motherfuckers kind of thing. It was like, no, we were attacked. This is a, that brings people together. I'm hoping that they don't have something planned like that again. To, it, it's OK. It, things are getting too divided. So we need that unifying force. And they, they pull some bullshit. I'm not trying to get it turned into a conspiracy theory thing or anything like that. I was just saying that it's, it, because there, there needs to be some unity. And I'm, I'm sure that the powers that be are seeing that. 
and, and what Chase is saying kind of gets to like, you know, my my thoughts on like big business is, uh, you know, once a business becomes big, they kind of tilt the playing field through like influence on policy and, uh, you know, in their favor, which makes it very difficult for others to like, I, I'm all for fair competition. Uh, like, I, you know, in California, if every craft farmer had the ability to compete on ability, I don't think a lot of them would be as stressed right now as they are, but they're not allowed to. And that's like, so it's kind of like, what are things that are typical, like, Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, like everything just kind of gets mixed up and I, I'm not going to articulate this well, but like, like, like if every one acre farm could go to a farmer's market uh, and sell their weed, they'd all sell out and, uh, and be able to pay their bills and put their family, um, Fishing does bring people together. <laughs> um, and it's a weird, it's like what we have isn't a Republican conservative vision. It's not a liberal democratic vision. It's just a fucked up vision. Like, because when, when you on one side or the other think about how you view yourselves or how you view the other side, like how California has played out doesn't reflect how Democrats, liberals view themselves. It doesn't reflect how Republicans, conservatives view Democrats and vice versa. Because um, you have like bureaucracy, right? Like uh, your, your libertarian slash conservative Republican would be like bureaucracy sucks, right? Like that's a Democrat thing. Um, and then there's stuff like, it's like, stuff from both I, I i don't know it's just it, it's it's not a like i've been thinking about this recently like it's like if you take people on total opposite ends of the spectrum i will take my parking ticket to illustrate but like one person views themselves as way over here and the other person as way over here and in my head i'm like you know what I view you guys as like you're the same person and if you just turned it into a circle you'd actually be touching each other on that circle if that makes sense like yeah. like you know it, it, it it's it's like um you know like radical like uh jihadist islam and then like but in america you have people who hate those people but are like super like, oh just say it there's radical christians too yeah <laughs> there's radical no, islam and, and there's radical christianity and, same fucking and, thing like you were showing yes yeah and <laughs> and so you you think you're over here and over here and it's like nope you're actually touching uh your your personalities are are similar it's just you're you're looking you're you're from a different vantage point um so anyway i'm i don't know i didn't think i was going to get into any of this and i didn't articulate it very well but uh anyway uh i like chill people like you <laughs> that's, i think that that's kind of what it gets back to is like <laughs> You know, it, it, it's like smoking, you know, my memory, th thinking of memories from your youth, like my memories growing up of smoking weed was always being surrounded by people I enjoyed being with. Everyone was chill. We were talking about the fucking stars and like what's out in space or like, what you know, just like enjoyable, peaceful and, uh, you know, and then like today's weed world, it's like people like fucking monkeys hurling feces at each other. And I'm like, don't you all, you all smoke weed. Like, like chill the fuck out people. Um, yeah. Why is everyone getting in fights with each other? Uh, <laughs> people like looking for differences instead of commonality. 
so anyway, we went we went d- deep deep yeah. off off the uh, the the. I'm looking. I'm like, what were we landscaping with nature? So anyway, in conclusion, <laughs> those are our final thoughts on landscaping with nature. <laughs> Learn from nature. Nature isn't religious. Nature isn't an extremist. Well, I guess in a way, nature can be an extremist, but it always reaches balance. That's the to bring it back to landscaping with nature, balance, equilibrium, the lost word. We can leave the lodge now. Oh shit. You know what? Those guys are starting up right now. So let's, uh, let's kill it. And all right, everybody can go over to youtube.com slash future. You can follow that link right there. Oh, I think I just lost him. (laughs) <laughs> he just left me. <laughs> All right. I don't think he meant to do that, but uh, thanks, everyone. And uh, yeah, Marco is growing, and that crew on Future Cannabis Project main channel right now, and then Chad uh, and his crew at 7 p.m. Pacific time right back here. Bye.